Okay, cool. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Carter Frost. I am a geek extraordinaire. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, a, a wide variety of, of different topics, uh, computer science, computer information studies, uh, robotics, computer security, a little bit of electrical engineering, uh, just a, a general mix mosh of, of, of various different subjects. Um, so um, I've worked uh, uh, in all kinds of different roles. I've worked um, in IT and cybersecurity, pri doing uh, uh, private key infrastructure stuff for like national ID systems and credit cards. I worked in manufacturing and shipping, uh, as well as quality assurance. Um, I've worked for companies in five different uh, countries. Um, and, and, and you know, that's, that, that, that's been a lot of fun. Um, but specifically here at Correo, uh, I've, I've uh, filled a, f a few different roles, um, some of which um, right now I'm a supplemental instructor for uh, beginning programming uh, in Java. In the last two years, I've been doing uh, C++, uh, as well as being the former uh, president for the Revives Club. Uh, and then in the past, I've also been a tutor and a data center technician here at Cabrillo, uh, and also uh, a student senator and, and the vice president of the student senate. Uh, so I've been I've been around. Um, so if you have any questions about anything uh, Cabrillo related, uh, what instructors uh, what instructors to talk to talk to about what, um, if you need any kind of services or financial support or any of that kind of stuff that has anything to do with Cabrillo um, or just making sure that you you are successful at Cabrillo, you can always contact me. Um, my email is is right here on the slide. Um, that will also indicate to me uh, how, how you got my email because uh, it's engineering5 at carterfrost.com. Uh, so that's, um, yeah. So if you have any questions about anything Cabrillo related um, or even if you're, if you're trying to transfer or whatnot, uh, I'm, I'll do the best I can to, to help you out there. Um, yeah, so that's, that's me. Um, but let's talk about some robots. Uh, just a brief introduction, and then we'll actually, I actually have some slides about robots uh, in general um, that we'll get to uh, later. But um, you, you may have seen both of these robots. I know, let me turn on my pointer. There we go. You may have seen Hopper here. Uh, Hopper is actually sitting next to me right now. Um, and then we have Kiri uh, up here in the top right. Um, and you may, if you've been in the STEM Center, you may have seen uh, Kiri wandering around. Um, and she's just a little cute household robot um, that, that, that drives around and, and, you know, purrs when you pet her and, and things like that. Um, and so I was the former uh, president of the robotics club. Uh, I, I did take a step back from the robotics club because I was at UCSC uh, this last quarter. But um, this, uh, this is my team uh, last year. This is uh, Darren Churchill. He was, a, he was a student at Cabrillo. And this is uh, Mike Batera. He's, he's a CIS instructor uh, here at Cabrillo. And there were uh, my, my two heavyweights um, this, uh, last year and the year before. Um, we have a much bigger team that was doing all, all kinds of other support roles. But uh, these were the, you know, the power horses, the, the code monkeys uh, that were investing a, a good amount of time uh, working on the, the robot. And so this is a picture of both of them uh, at Kennedy Space Center um, uh, last last year uh, that's in Florida. Uh, I was actually doing an engineering camp with Roxanne when they were when they were getting this award. And then um, the people on either side, uh, this is Melanie. Uh, she um, she's uh, one of a founding member of a biological uh, laboratory. Um, that I'm going to be that I'm working with uh, for the next two years, um, and then this is uh, Matthew Frick. He's uh, he's a computer science instructor at uh, University of New Mexico, and um, I'll be working with him uh, also at the biological laboratory uh, for the next two years. Um, and that's sort of just like a little fun task, uh, like a little fun thing. Um, there is money involved, but I think that all the money that I make is going to just I'm going to funnel it right in the robot into the Cabrillo Robotics Club. Um, uh, and, then, and then this woman in the center, I totally am blanking on her name, but she works, uh, she works for the former Department of Education at NASA. Um, so I don't know, actually, I don't know what, what, she, what she does now because that department doesn't exist anymore because of Trump. 
But um, yeah, so she she was uh, instrumental into uh, getting uh, getting us funding uh, to to have that uh, to have the robotics competition. So if you're interested in joining the robotics club, uh, just blast an email uh, to this to this to this Gmail address. Um, that's uh, Marine uh, is on the other side of that. She'll she'll receive your email and add you to the lists. Um, also, if you're just interested in, in just you know, following along and figuring out what's going on with the club, uh, you can also just uh, follow our, our, our Facebook page. Um, we also have a, have a Twitter and all of that, and I try to keep all the information duplicate on that. And then there's also an email newsletter that you would get added to if you added the, if you send an email to Gmail. So yeah, if you're interested in, in robotics, there's no, uh, there's no base knowledge requirement or anything to join the robotics club. Uh, everyone is welcome. And actually having diverse backgrounds is, is, is very much encouraged. Uh, it helps us think outside the box and, and is really useful for when, when we're trying to uh, do some problem solving. Most of the time, the hardest problems are stuff that we have you know, written on a whiteboard and we're just trying to draw boxes and arrows and figure out you know, which arrow going which direction is, is the, the proper thing to do. Um, the coding part tends to be the, the easy part. It's, it's actually problem solving and figuring out what to do next that, that tends to be the most difficult thing. Uh, so everybody's welcome. So they can blast an email to this. To this. Um, yeah, okie dokie. I had a quick question about that. Yeah, go for it. Um, do you guys, um, on the more design side of things, uh, what do you guys use, just out of curiosity, like when you're actually gonna design the robot? Like programming, uh, program wise. Oh, pr programming wise, programming wise, or, or like, like physical design. Like, yeah, like physical. Yeah, like physical so you're gonna create, you're gonna a, create wheel. a wheel. Like what like, program would you use to design that wheel? Like uh, Microbell or uh, AutoCAD or Revit or. Yeah. So um, there's not really many people in the club who who have a technical background with CAD work. Um, I use a little bit of Autodesk uh, Inventor. Uh, to do some to, to do some 3D modeling and and and, and touching up some design work, um, but it's it's pretty limited so far. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, most of the people who did 3D design uh, and did like prints and stuff, uh, they they've grad they graduated a few years ago. Um, right now, the club has been very much a hardware club uh, for the last few years, but that's changing uh, a great deal re uh, recently. Um, okay. But we have a ton of we have a ton of software available to us at Cabrillo uh, for free for student use, um, and yeah, so so essentially whatever you're comfortable with, uh, we have access to the maker space. You know when that's open again, um, I have yeah I, I have a ton of material down there that that could be used by anyone who's a member of the club uh, if they wanted to print out robotic parts. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I got about all my experience in AutoCAD and stuff. So I was just kind of curious about that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is also part of the Stormathon. The, this is a, this is a, a, a chart of, of uh, part of the report that we would have, that we produced for NASA uh, last year. Um, and so this is actually, this, this is actually a poster that's hanging up at Kennedy Space Center um, uh, at Swamp Works. Uh, for for and that's a robotics laboratory there that they are building robots to to do um, to do mining um, on, on various planetary bodies, um, and so just just sort of a, a quick tour of what's going on here. So we have the forging strategy, which is essentially how we go around looking for uh, resources. Let's see. I need to mute somebody. Here, just do that. Uh, Yes. Okay. Um, so, so the forging strategy is essentially how you would go go around searching for resources, and resources are, are these little cubes um, that, yeah, that, that I have. Um, or, and and the and the arena would have 256 of these uh, spread out or or less. Um, but the forging strategy that we used was a correlated random walk, which is essentially like pick a random direction, pick a random distance and then go there and then pick another random direction and another random distance and go there. Um, and cor the word correlated essentially means that we tend to go in the same general direction that we never randomly turn around and go backwards. Um, 
and so that allows us to, that correlated random walk allows us to explore the most amount of area as quickly as possible. And uh, that gave us a huge leg up uh, it, because the time, because the competition had a time limit. Each of the rounds had a specific time limit. If the round, if the purpose of the competition was more of like, you know, find every single resource in an area, um, then we would have probably gone through like a spiral search or something a little bit more thorough. But uh, even in life, when we're searching for things, uh, we tend to not um, do an ab you know, absolutely methodical search. We, we tend to do uh, something that's more bouncing around and, and trying to cover the most amount of area as possible. Um, and then another thing that we, we, we had was uh, our software features of, of trying to make our code as accessible as possible for new developers. Um, and so we tried to illustrate that. And then also uh, a flow chart of the, of the various uh, behavior states uh, that, that the robot would go into. So um, we initialize the robot, we would go into searching, we would see, we would try to pick up a cube if we had found a cube, get, we go home, we drop it off at home, and then we go back into searching. Um, in general, that you have this sort of state machine um, and that you can sort of go backwards or an error could happen and, and like maybe you pick up and you, you, you lost the cube somehow when you were trying to pick it up. Then you go back to searching for a cube, things like that. Um, and one of the biggest problems with the competition was that the hardware that we were provided and that was in all of the robots was faulty. Uh, and so we had this huge hardware constraint um, because we were unable to, we were not allowed to modify any of the hardware because even though we had three of these robots here, um, there were 24 of these robots at Kennedy Space Center in Florida that we could not touch. Those robots essentially were turned on, our code was downloaded onto them, and the, and the robot was told go. So we couldn't, we physically couldn't even touch the robots, which was incredibly frustrating uh, when, when we ran into problems. So we had to figure out a way to, to sort of resolve that. And so uh, we essentially at Cabrillo, uh, Darren Churchill um, wrote up a ton of code for uh, mapping out all of the data for the, the IMU, essentially imagine like a, a 3D compass, um, and that he was able to collect all that data. And, uh, and you can see it's that blue thing, how distorted it is. Um, versus the red thing is more of a sphere. Um, and that's what we wanted. We wanted this more sphere, the sphere thing. And so instead we, there was this ellipsoid of data and it was symmetric, which meant that you could turn, you could turn exactly 180. But if you turn, like if it, so you could drive out from home, turn around and drive straight back and that was okay. But at the moment that you made an extra turn and you drove any distance, you'd immediately get lost. Uh, and you don't want a rover that gets lost the moment it, you know, it, like the robot couldn't even do a triangle. Um, it, it was that bad. And so uh, we were able to resolve that in software, but that was a huge constraint. And that's what gave us a huge leg up against all of the other teams. Uh, one of the features also is that we had a planner that allowed us to, to map things. And then also to, uh, whenever a robot would say, hey, I need to go home, it knew where obstacles were, it knew where walls were, and it could essentially make a plan to drive around them. Um, and that was incredibly useful too. Um, and then I wrote a ton of automated testing. That's all of this stuff. Um, and essentially that allowed me to um, run simulations of, um, run simulations uh, of, of the robot. So, so one of the developers would say, Hey, I think, I think I have some code that would work. And I would, and I would pull the code. I would look at it and say, yeah, the, the code looks pretty good. And then I would run the code. Um, I would run about a hundred simulations um, over the course of two days on, on a stack of servers that we have at Cabrillo. Um, and I would figure out whether or not it was an improvement or whether or not it was a regression. Um, and sometimes even though the code looked good and the behavior did what, what we thought it would do, uh, maybe the, it maybe it was too slow. Maybe the physical, it would slow down the, phys, the physical rover and that would end up meaning that over the course of time, we would collect less cubes by being more cautious. And so there was this fine balance that we had to strike uh, on of, we had this huge time constraint per round, um, but then also we wanted to be as careful as possible. Um, and so trying to balance that, try to balance that out of like, do we do the right thing or do we do the fast thing? 
And uh, what we ended up doing was uh, our rovers, when we're searching and driving around, we actually drive at half the speeds uh, all of the other teams did. Um, uh, just because we noticed that just because like if we saw something like a wall or, or something, if we were going much slower, we could respond appropriately by stopping and slowing down and figuring out if we're actually looking at a wall or whatnot. Um, but also it meant that the motion blur on the camera was, was very much reduced because we were going slower, which meant that we were able to see more cubes. Um, and so uh, other teams would totally miss the cubes. They would drive right by them. Um, well, we saw them because the motion blur wasn't that bad. So there was this huge advantage of us going half the speed um, driving around as, as other teams because we were able to see more. Uh, and we were able to respond to things uh, more quickly um, by going slower. Uh, so that's just a general sort of idea of what, what, what we had been doing for the last three years uh, in, in the club. Whoops. Okay. Uh, so yeah, any, any questions about the robotics club uh, and me specifically before I start diving into the material? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, 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 how bad could, bad could speaking now? Now. I, I, I didn't get that. Say, that, say again, Rox? Like when, like when, 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 Sorry, are they Sorry, still? Are they I'm going to. Okay. Well, uh, Rox has muted herself, so I don't know what that means. Okay, so uh, let's move. Let's move on. Uh, so the first thing uh, let's talk about is electrical engineering. Um, so I just want to be upfront. Um, I am not an electrical engineer. Uh, this is just a hobby of mine. Uh, and I have the utmost respect for people who are real uh, electrical engineers. Um, uh, okay, that's rocks. There we go. Um, yeah, so, so people who are electrical engineers it requires a, a pretty decent chunk of, of education uh, that I'm really not willing to, willing to put up with. So I just sort of uh, keep doing it as a hobby. Okay. So... Uh, Uh, Rox is, is asking if, if, the, uh, if the robotics club is, is meeting virtually, and uh, we are not right now. Um, but depending on how, how bored people get, uh, that might change. Um, but yeah, if you blast an email to, to that address, uh, you'll be notified if, any, if anything happens. Okay, so electrical engineering. So we see electrical engineering in all kinds of electronics, digital computers, power engineering, telecommunications, um, control systems, uh, radio frequency engineering, signal processing, instrumentation, and, and, and microelectronics. Pretty much we see electricity, or we see electrical engineering and anything that deals with electricity, just in general. If it uses electricity, hopefully you have an electrical engineer who's involved. Um, and that's not always true. Um, so the Swarmy, the, the robot that I have sitting next to me, which I guess I could turn this back on. Um, yeah. The the Swarmy, the, the robot that I have sitting right here, um, was not. They did not ask an electrical engineer uh, to look at the the, the, the um, look at the specs and, and lay things out. Uh, they had somebody who who sort of learned how to use the software themselves. Um, and this board here, this blackboard with all the this white uh, with all the white traces, um, was what they ended up designing. And this board here is specifically how the voltage distribution works uh, on this particular robot that I have. And there's hundreds of these robots all over the place. And they didn't consult an electrical engineer when they designed this board. And one of the problems is that one of these traces, one of these wires here, they accidentally made. Uh, they made thinner than the other one that's symmetric. You notice how these look very much symmetric. It's because we have a left side and a right side motor. Um, there are two sets of motors. We have four motors. So we have, the left, we have a left side and a right side motor. And one of the traces was smaller. And what happens is that if you apply the same current and the same voltage to the motors, that because one of the traces was smaller, 
not all of the, not the same amount of current um, and voltage would arrive on the other side um, to the motor. And so what happens is that the robot would list. Essentially, it would sort of drive sideways-ish because one, one side was going faster than the other side. Um, and we had always attributed it to, oh, there was just a problem with the IMU. And because we use IMU data to tell whether or not we're going straight or not, um, and because the robot, when they designed it, isn't balanced, like mechanically, the weight, the weight is not balanced. So we always attribute it to the, an IMU problem and that the robot wasn't balanced and so that the tire pressure would be different. But what happened was that uh, I was talking with a student at um, uh, a university in Puerto Rico and they had actually, they had actually like put in probes and actually tested it and then looked at the design work of the board and realized, oh, one of the traces was smaller because they actually had a real electrical engineer to, to look at it. Um, and so that caused problems for, for you know, hundreds of robots that were all over the place um, because this was designed by somebody who wasn't an electrical engineer. So hopefully that helps illustrate the importance of having an electrical engineer to at least look at the designs well, you may look at this and say, yeah, that looks pretty good. That looks legitimate. Um, any electrical engineer that would look at this would immediately go, oh, that's wrong. That, that trace is too small. Um, and, and we wouldn't have had the problem that <laughs> all these robots have. And there's not an easy way to fix it because the board was already manufactured um, and is already installed in hundreds of robots. And it would take thousands of man hours to go and fix all of that um, when they could have just you know, afford it as an email to somebody and had them you know, had to have an electrical engineer look at it and fixed it very, you know, on, on development. Um, yeah, so essentially, if you do, if something deals with electricity, you need an electrical engineer, and electrical engineers have the best toys. They have the best equipment. Um, they have all of these, these digital voltmeters and multimeters. Here we have a, a very nice uh, oscilloscope. Here we have a very nice power bench power supply, another oscilloscope back here, another uh, bench power supply. Um, you know, a lot of very, very expensive equipment right here. Um, and you sort of need all of it uh, to, to, really do, to really do the job. Um, and so whenever you walk into somebody's office, you can very easily tell if they're electrical engineer or not because they have all kinds of cool stuff on their table or on their desk. Um, and we see them everywhere. We see, we see electronics everywhere. We see them in computers and robots and cell phones, our credit cards, our radar navigation systems. You know, even the wiring in, in our buildings uh, has electricity flowing through it. So um, hopefully an electrical engineer is involved in all parts of that. Um, we, see, we see it in you know, the, medical, the medical industry, the aerospace industry, the military, even eBay. Um, you would think that, oh, well, eBay is just a software company. Well, eBay has infrastructure that they have to maintain, but also maybe they're selling things and they need an electrical engineer who actually understands what things are uh, in order to efficiently sell them or, or be able to, to list them properly. Uh, and so they bring in electrical engineers to, to make sure that's, that's done correctly. Um, so yeah, if, essentially, if, if it deals with electricity, there are jobs as an electrical engineer. So that's a pretty safe bet to, to go into being an electrical engineer. So I've been talking about like, well, that you need to know electricity in order to be an electrical engineer, but what is electricity? We can think of electricity as it just being whenever there's a difference of charges, essentially there's more electrons somewhere um, than another place. And when those electrons then go to balance themselves out to that other place, that's when we see uh, that's when we see the current flowing is when the when the electrons are flowing. And so we sort of break electricity down to two different types, um, but the, st the concepts are still the same. But the electrons um, are wanting to balance themselves out. So the first one is static electricity, and then the other one is current electricity. And we'll talk about both of those. So current electricity is what we think of as like a battery that, um, that the electricity wants to balance out, that the electrons, the electrons want to balance themselves out. So the electrons are going to the area where there aren't as many electrons. And what happens is that when they balance themselves out, when there's the same number of electrons on both sides here, the battery chart doesn't have any charge anymore. 
because the electrons don't want to go anywhere. So here, here's an inside of, of, a, of a battery. And essentially you have your cathode, which is essentially neutral. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing going on. Um, and then you have your electrons hanging out in your anode. And then there's a separator between the two. And the separator essentially keeps the electrons from immediately just jumping through into the cathode. And so what happens is that if you attach a wire to either side of the, the battery, that wire is going to get very, very toasty. And, and that's because the electrons are flowing through it as quickly as they can. And so what you can do is if you stick things in the middle, you know, or if in the way along the line, like a light bulb, then you light up the light bulb. Not like a household light bulb, but like an LED or, or a smaller light bulb. Um, that essentially, the, and, and the light bulb works by electrons flowing through it. And that's how most electronic components work. Uh, and so what happens is that when the electrons balance, when there's the same number, or, or when there's the same ratio of electrons down here and in here, the battery doesn't have a charge. And if you have a rechargeable battery, then that means that you have um, some kind of property that allows us to essentially pump the electrons out of the cathode and back into the anode. And there's, there's a wide variety of ways of, of, of that happening, of, of how you do that. Uh, some batteries, you can chemically recharge them. Um, there, yeah, there, there are ways of, of doing plating and there's all kinds of different ways in which you can recharge a battery. Um, but yeah, so, so in general, when they balance out, you don't have a charge anymore because the electrons are, are perfectly content staying where they are because they're nice and balanced out. Okay, so some power sources. This is where I get to ask you questions. So ready, you're, you're turning off your mute. Um, does anyone know what this thing is? Or, or specifically what, what kind of, what is it using to generate power? Hydroelectric? Hydroelectric. Not quite. That's this guy over here. I, I missed that. What was that? Uh, like uh, hydro. Hydro. Um, I forget the name. Well, what is, what is it using for power? Water. How does water. it get power? Yeah, and what is the, what is the water doing? Moving. 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 Right. And what do we call moving water in, in, the, in the case of the ocean? Wave. Brand. Brand. We call waves. Yeah. Waves. There's, that there's, waves, there's waves going by. Um, there are ways of generating um, power from current, but we wouldn't see that. That would be, under, that would be underwater, right? Um, that, the, that the current and the current could just be a turbine or something like that. Um, but in this case, this is wave energy is that this giant floaty thing right here it actually rotates uh, inside the structure based on the wave, and that helps, and that and that generates power. What about this guy in the middle, on the top middle? What is, what is this? This is very local. We should all recognize it. Moss Landing. Yeah, and what is what do they do at Moss Landing? Hydroelectric plant. It is not a hydroelectric. Is it plant. coal? Coal. It is not coal. What are we the Saudi Arabia of? <laughs> steam power? Uh, I mean, there is steam, but you have to do, you have natural to heat up the steam. Gas. Natural gas, exactly. It's a giant natural gas peaker plant. And we don't really see it operating that often, which is a good thing because it's a peaker plant. Only during peak times or, or peak days or whatever, uh, will they power it on? Um, and it's very, very expensive to power it on. It's, 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 it's at least a million dollars to power it on, even for an hour. Um, the spin up and the spin down process is very, very expensive and, and takes a long time. So if you know, everybody turns on their air conditioner at 3 p.m., which is what happens a lot, um, the power company would much prefer, much rather, um, have, you know, just shutting people off, like doing a rolling blackout or, you know, sending out a flex alert saying, hey, everyone, reduce your power, reduce your power usage, you know, turn off your dishwashers, turn off your, your clothing washers. 
uh, to try to to try to reduce the power usage because they really don't want to power up this peaker plant. And once they power it on, they're they're going to leave it on for a little bit because the you know the, the cost to power it up and power it down um, is relatively expensive. And so what they'll do is that if they do power it up, they they'll store the excess energy in other spots. So for example, at Moss Landing, um, I think out of the four reactors that we have or whatever, yeah, um, um, the spots where, where we have turbines, um, only two of them are operational. And so we're, uh, we're, we're converting uh, two of them to just being battery storage. So essentially we're building a giant Tesla power wall um, that whenever we have excess energy, we're gonna dump it in the batteries and then whenever we have peak times where we need a little bit of extra power, we will drain the power from those batteries. Um, and so we're, we're migrating that way fairly slowly. And then what, and then what about this? I heard this uh, said multiple times. What, what is this guy? Hydroelectric. Hydroelectric. Yeah, hydroelectric is that we have a giant body of water up, up above and a giant a body of water down below. And, and essentially, whenever we need extra power, uh, we're able to drain, oh, we're able to drain that water down and we have turbines, just giant fans that spin uh, and they then generate power for us. And whenever we have extra power, we're able to pump water up um, and, that, and, and that essentially is treating the, these bodies of water like giant batteries. Uh, and so what's cool is that if for some reason we powered, we had to power up this peaker plant and, we, and, and not all the power was being consumed, we could essentially use all that extra power to pump water up. And then we could power this guy down. And now we have uh, an extra reservoir physically of water, but, but also of power. So that then the next time we desperately need a little bit of extra power, we can drain the water down for energy instead of having to power up this giant peaker plant. Um, so diversifying how we're getting power and how we're storing power is, is, is a very useful thing. Uh, what about these two guys? We, we should know what these are. What are these? Solar and wind. Solar and wind. Yeah, so, solar panels and, and, and wind turbines. Um, and, these, and these are quite useful because as far as I know, uh, the sun's not going away anytime soon. Uh, and, the, um, and the wind is, tends to stay windy in places. Uh, as opposed to natural gas, well, we may have a ton of it. Uh, it's biomass, and uh, there's only so many dead dinosaurs that we could burn up uh, before we, or di dead dinosaur poop that we can burn up um, before before we run out. Um, and you know, wave energy, as long as we have the moon, uh, we'll be pretty good. We'll we'll ha we'll continue to have waves. I, I guess as long as we also have the ocean and the moon. Um, what about this guy, the bottom center? What is this? Sort of crude drawing, huh? Oil, oil. No, not quite. Geothermal? Geothermal? Yeah, it's geothermal. Um, that geothermal is essentially just using the difference of temperature in two spots. Uh, and that difference in temperature allows us to, to, run, uh, to run an engine, essentially. And then that engine we then connect in for uh, electrical to a generator to produce uh, electricity. And one of the nifty things about geothermal is that you don't necessarily have to go, you know, in this picture, which is what we tend to think about with geothermal, is that we go down to where it's nice and toasty in the earth, and maybe we, we drill into some body of water where it's nice and cool, uh, and we use the temperature difference from these two things. Um, but that's not necessary. Uh, for example, and in, in, in that immediately gets converted to electricity. Uh, there's a few spots in uh, South America where um, they actually use the temperature of the seawater because um, that's, a, that's a very constant temperature and the temperature of the village uh, nearby, just the ambient temperature, and that that difference is enough to run the pump that continues to pump the seawater um, and run a full desalination plant to make fresh water, as well as uh, providing a lot of mechanical um, energy, so not electrical engineering uh, energy, but as like these gears are turning around and they're able to use it for manufacturing for um, or, or, or food processing where they're able to you know, crush, where they're able to crush grains and make, you know, and make flour and, and, and things like that. 
Um, and so they're using the geothermal plant purely for mechanical, um, for mechanical uses and for making water. They're, they never convert it to uh, electricity. And then we don't really think of batteries as a power source, but a lot of batteries, when we make, when we make them, we don't have to charge them. That just the chemical properties, uh, when we create the batteries, um, inherently has a charge. Um, and th there, there's a wide variety of different kinds of chemicals that we use for making batteries, right? We have our, our lead acid, we have our nickel cadmium, um, we have our lithiums, uh, we have all kinds of different kinds of uh, kinds of batteries, but um, like button batteries, like what we see in a watch, and hearing aid batteries um, are actually very different kinds of, of, of batteries. A uh, hearing aid battery, while it may be the same shape, there's actually a little tape cover on it. And what happens is the moment you pull a tape cover off of it, it's now producing electricity because there's a chemical reaction to oxygen in the atmosphere um, that, that essentially allows those electrons to, to, to flow from one side to the other. Um, and so hearing aid batteries, you can't just pop the cover off and let them sit out for a few weeks. They'll, they'll die by themselves. Uh, versus a, um, a watch battery, a lithium battery, is good for tens of years. Um, so there's all kinds of different kinds of chemical reactions that we can utilize uh, to generate power. Um, I'm sure somebody's seen like the potato clock or the lemon clock um, that you're able to use uh, the chemical properties of just two different kinds of metal uh, in something that's uh, relatively acidic uh, to be able to essentially generate power. Uh, so yeah, so those are our, our primary, uh, our primary uh, power sources. And actually here in Santa Cruz County, one of our primary uh, power sources is actually burning methane uh, from the dumps. Um, all of our dumps have these reactors that essentially burn off the extra methane uh, and that then that goes directly into our power grid, which isn't quite the most sustainable thing, but at least it's better than just dumping the atmosphere directly into the atmosphere. That's, that's pretty nasty too. So you win some, you lose some. Okay, so that was current electricity. Now let's talk about static electricity. So if you've ever you know, played around uh, you know, on, on the carpet with your socks and then you touch like the cat's nose uh, or a piece of metal or another person, but there'll be this, this nice little shock that occurs. And what's happening is that as you're wandering around on your socks, you're, uh, you're picking up electrons. And what happens is that the ratio of electrons that you have relative to whatever you're touching um, is going to be different. And the electrons, again, just like with current electricity, they wanna balance themselves out. And so they're gonna transfer. And when they transfer, when the electrons jump from one thing to another to, to balance themselves out, uh, you get this nice little shock. And so um, I'm sure some of you have played with a, with a Van Graaff generator. And essentially what happens is that it just has a little, little like, a, like a rubber band and a carpet. Um, and they, they, rub, they rub together and you're essentially stealing electrons. And those electrons are then being dumped up here in this dome and that the concentration of electrons is much higher in this dome than in, in the rest of our environment. And so what happens is when you stick your hand on it and you turn it on, the electrons that are in this dome that are being dumped into this dome will also balance out with you because you're touching it. But if, for example, your hand wasn't on it, you turn the machine on and then you went to touch the machine, it would shock you. Uh, there would be this giant arc that would hit you and it would hurt a lot. Uh, but it wouldn't really do much damage because the, the dome, the surface area of this dome is, is fairly limited with, because intentionally because we don't want to actually harm somebody. Uh, so they're designed with that intention that they'll just hurt, but they won't do any damage. Um, and so what, what's cool is that if you, if you were to stick your hand on it, power it on, then turn it off, and then remove your hand from it, you now still maintain a ton of electrons you're losing them pretty quickly from, you know, things in, in the, the atmosphere bumping into you. Um, but you could pretty much, you could pretty quickly turn around and go poke something metal and cause a giant shock, or you could poke somebody on the nose and, um, and shock them. Um, because you have more electrons, you know, ratio wise than they do. Um, because we are just giant bags of mostly water. Um, 
with a little bit of salt, and the salt helps us be even more conductive, uh, and that helps us hold more electrons. Um, I got a yeah. cool little so static. Cool little, oh. cool. oh. Sorry. Go for Sorry. it. Oh, uh, I got a cool little uh, static cool electricity little... tidbit. Um, I learned recently, like a month ago. Um, so on aircraft, they got these little dangly things at the, the tips of their wings. Um, and they actually discharge the electricity because as they're flying through the air at, at altitude, they'll, they'll create, they'll get a static charge. Um, so they, they, the way they dissipate these things, they stick little rubber um, I don't know what you want to call them, but little rubber attachments at the edge of it to dissipate that static electricity so it doesn't damage the, air, the aircraft. I thought it was pretty cool. I wanted to share. Yeah, um, actually aircraft, um, and we, we talked about this uh, this morning actually in, in the other Engineering 5, um, that yeah, just them rubbing up against the clouds, uh, they, they're able to pick up a ton of electrons, um, but also like people who work on power lines, um, they have helicopters and what happens is that when they go to work on the power lines, they have these giant like probes that look very much like the Van Graaff generator, except uh, smaller and longer, um, that they go and touch the power line. And then the person then is brought to the same potential, essentially their ratio of electrons is balanced out with what's on the power line and they're able to hop over. Um, and that means that the whole um, helicopter is actually brought to the same potential um, as the power line which meant, means that if the, if the helicopter was just to land um, pretty immediately, it would instantly kill everyone in the helicopter. And so um, what they have to do is, is when they're, when they're you know, embarking and disembarking is that they have to bring everybody to the same potential. And then the, the helicopter will actually fly around uh, sort of unnecessarily, but necessarily, like you'll be looking at it, like why is the helicopter just wandering around? Um, and what they're doing is that they're just trying to rub off their ex excess electrons into the atmosphere um, so that they can get rid of them and they can sort of balance out with the environment. Uh, and there's tricks for if, if they needed to land quicker that they could, they could discharge uh, if there was a proper setup on ground. Um, but, but in most cases, uh, they just have to wait until they're sort of out balanced with the environment uh, because, because of the, the high voltage power lines that they were working at, that they were at that potential. Um, yeah, so you can definitely do some damage. And actually, if you watch some slow motion videos of, of uh, lightning, you can actually see that the lightning um, actually goes upwards because the, the amount of electrons that are in the ground is a little bit higher ratio wise than the areas that's sort of in the center of the sky. And so what happens is that the electrons will essentially, um, they'll, they'll cause a little small little arc upwards and they'll hit the center, of the center of the sky. And what happens is that then the clouds who have a lot more electrons, um, they see those little feelers and they essentially meet them halfway and then they'll continue all the way down to the ground because the because the ratio of electrons in the clouds versus at the ground, um, the clouds have a lot more electrons. And so um, it's really cool to watch because you know suddenly first you see lightning come up from the ground, very slow mo, um, and then you see the lightning come from above. That's just so much more powerful. Um, yeah, so it's just a nifty thing to see. Um, and yeah, poking. Poking cats while while you're while, while you're energized is, is always fun. Uh, they appreciate it a great deal. All right. Okay, so let's talk about components. Uh, so component, literally like the English definition, is a part or a element of a larger whole. Um, and in this context, we're talking about you know, part of a machine or a vehicle, right? If we just had power sources. Um, that wouldn't really be particularly useful. We have to connect various things to those power sources and maybe connect them in different configurations in different orders to make it do different things. Um, and so I can just quickly quickly run through these guys. We have our capacitors. Um, you can think of capacitors as, uh, as very quick, very temporary batteries. Um, and, and they're very robust. They can handle being charged very quickly and discharged very quickly. And so 
one of the things that we do, if, if anyone's actually used a real camera, not like the camera on your phone, um, you can actually hear these charging up um, when you flash, when you, when you hit the, the flash on the camera, you can hear that whining sound. Um, and, and what happens is that there's a normal battery that's very slow, very slow to charge. And what it does is that it slowly charges up this capacitor because um, the battery itself can't handle the flash. The flash is too much for the, for the battery um, in the sense of the instantaneous current that's required. And so what happens is the battery slowly charges this capacitor and then literally in an instant when you hit the, when you hit the, 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 the shoot button, um, that it instantly discharges this capacitor and dumps all of that power into, into the flash. Um, so yeah, capacitors are really useful for, for that. Um, and so uh, some modern supercars, uh, that's what they do is they have these giant capacitors that are you know, the size of your fist to the size of your head and multiple of them that um, instead of having you know, normal traditional batteries for like an electric car, they, ha they just have these giant capacitors and that allows them to be able to slam on the brakes, dump as much power as possible from the brakes into, into the capacitors uh, instead of just burning it up as material. And then when they hit the the go-go the go, -go, the go, -go switch, uh, that it dumps all of that power instantaneously back into the engine and allows them to accelerate at insane speeds. Okay, diodes. Let's talk about diodes. Uh, diodes are, are like uh, if we're going to be using the water analogy, which we'll probably be doing. Um, diodes are like a one-way valve. They allow the current to flow in one direction, uh, and that's a useful thing uh, to have especially in electronics because you have, you have current, you, you have energy flowing all over the place uh, and you need to be able to restrict everything to one direction. Otherwise you might burn up components or you might have components that just don't work properly if you, if you try to uh, operate them backwards. Um, and so there's a combination of a diode and a light called a light emitting diode. And what happens is that as current goes through the proper direction, it lights up. But if current tries to go through the opposite direction, nothing happens. No current is allowed through and the light doesn't light up. So this is a light emitting diode. So this is just a normal diode. This is light emitting. We have our octocouples. Uh, this allows us to um, this allows us to control uh, whether or not uh, things are connected or disconnected. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about how these are useful. Then we have these things called resistor, resistors. I'll, I'll jump down here. And what a resistor does is it allows us to limit the amount of current going from one, you know, from a power source to something that, uh, or to the other side of the power source um, or to a component. Maybe a component can't handle all of the current that the battery or the other power source can supply. So we put these resistors in the way and they offer resistance. And what they do is that they convert that extra that excess ener energy that it's being felt that is filtering out into heat, and so resistors can get a little bit toasty. Um, and there's multiple varieties of resistors. Uh, one of them is a photoresistor, one that it changes its the resistance that it offers based on how much light it's exposed to. So maybe you have um, a, a cabinet that opens up when it's sun when it's uh, sunny uh, because you have plants in it. But then when it gets overcast and it's rainy, the, cab the cabinet automatically will close. Well, you could do that with a photoresistor. And you just have you know, a small computer on the other side that's looking at this photoresistor that says, hey, I noticed that I'm seeing this resistance. That means it's either cloudy or it's sunny. Then you have the, another type of resistor is called a potentiometer or a variable resistor. And that allows you to change the resistance um, by turning this dial. So it's a, it's a pretty useful thing. Um, and if we were doing the Arduino activity, we, we would have gotten a chance to play with these. But unfortunately, due to the plague, uh, we are not. So I apologize for that. OK, the next thing that we uh, are going to talk about are relays. This is a way that we can control uh, how things are connected. Um, if you ever walked into like a big building and you flip the light switch and everything doesn't immediately come on, maybe you hear like chunking or clicking noises uh, happening in the ceiling or in the wall, that's a pretty good indication that there's, the, that there's a relay involved. And what happens is that 
maybe the switch that you flipped, maybe it couldn't handle the amount of current that needs to, that needs to flow in order to turn on all of those lights. So instead we have a, a controller, uh, we have something like a switch, just a button switch or like a light switch, and it, can, and it controls the relay. It tells the relay open or close, and the relay then does that. And the relay is built to be able to handle uh, much more current. Uh, then we have our stepper motor. Um, we see these in, uh, in like a lot of CNC mills and lathes, you know, that, that giant machine that, that we have in, in the corner, the, both the giant machines that we have in the corner um, in, in 810 in your classroom. Uh, those uh, rely heavily on having stepper motors because stepper motors allow us to know uh, where, what position everything is in, which allows us to make very exact uh, cut operations. Um, and we have our switches, just you know, like an on off switch, um, or in this case is a, just a push button switch. And then uh, the best, the, save the best for last, we got our transistors. And transistors are really the thing that brought us into the computer age. Uh, the issue with the relays is that they take a noticeable, uh, a relay, this guy up here, is that it takes a noticeable amount of time to turn something on or turn something off. Like you flip a switch and then you hear a clicking off in the background. Or uh, like the blinker, when you turn on the blinker in your car, that's a relay uh, that you can hear clicking on and off. And, and it's a set of relays that sort of uh, toggle each other um, that it, internally. Um, and those are quite slow. Right, we're able to, to perceive them within our, you know, within our experience of, of perception. Um, and that's really not practical for computers. Computers much work much, much quicker uh, turning things on and off uh, than, than a relay does. And so we rely on these things called transistors to be able to turn things on and off based on a given input. Um, very useful creatures. Um, and we're able to make them very, very tiny. Uh, to the point where we have millions, if not billions of them in this, something the size of your pinky nail. Um, and they work at, pr at pretty much light speed. Um, the materials is, is very quick uh, that, that the electrons flow over on it. So yeah, transistors are pretty useful and they allow us to make uh, small electronics, but you can also buy uh, transistors that are relatively big that, that can handle um, heavy, heavy loads. Uh, you might hear them referred to as a MOSFET. Okay, uh, so we got more switches. These are like push button switches. Uh, you might have seen some of these uh, as like limit switches. Like these, these are limit switches inside of the those CNC machines that we have in 810. Well, hopefully we have a ton of these all over the place in the machine because if the machine does anything uh, radical, like it goes, it, it, it swings way too far one way or the other way, it's gonna hit one of these limit switches and it's gonna tell the machine to stop moving. Um, and that's a very useful thing to have. Then we have a DC motor with a little fan. We've got some standard household light bulbs. Uh, we got some coils. And then let's talk about transformers, the last thing, the transformers, the last component. Um, transformers allow us to change uh, voltage. And it allows us to separate, um, to separate the power source uh, from whatever's using the power. Uh, so we see transformers, like for how we charge our cell phones, for example, is that we have the wall power, which is 110 volts alternating current. If you were to plug your phone directly into that, your phone would literally explode and fly, you know, fly, fly a few, uh, quite a few feet away um, across the room and probably put a hole on the other side of the, you know, put a hole on the other side of the wall. Because um, the, the energy is just absolutely not compatible. And so we use these transformers to convert that, that 110 uh, volts alternating current to something that is consumable by the phone, which would be more along the lines of 5.5 you know, .5 volts. So from 110 volts to 5.5 volts. Um, and then we're also changing from alternating current to direct current. And so uh, using transformers with some diodes to rectify the AC to DC, uh, you're able to now take something that's totally you know, too power thing, uh, you know, two, two uh, power requirements that are totally incompatible with each other and make them compatible with each other. So we can, we should be very appreciative that these, that these things called transformers exist. Um, but also they allow us to, to separate things 
uh, using coils and transformers, which are you know, sort of synonymous, is that there's this giant ele uh, electromagnetic field uh, that they have that, that that surrounds them, or you know, that they generate, um, and that helps stabilize things. So, for example, if there's a power surge, uh, that field is able to sort of absorb uh, a little bit of that. And so that's why we're able to have power surges. And um, for the most part, if we didn't buy a really crappy transformer, uh, why our cell phones don't explode? Um, because the transformer, uh, especially if the surge is very, very brief, or if the brownout is very, very brief, the, the transformer has a field that it's maintaining uh, to help that out. And then we can use a combination of, of polarized capacitors on the DC side to make that even more smooth. And we can also add more coils um, to, to make to, to make the field much more stable. So there's lots of tricks to, to keeping your phone from exploding and, and we try to utilize uh, all of them if possible. Uh, any questions about components? I've, I've been talking a lot, sorry. Sort of happens. Okay, everyone saw it on components? Okay. All right, let's move on to, I, I've been using the word conductor, but what does that even mean? Um, so, uh, and resistors. So uh, we consider things, you know, the nice expensive metals uh, to be really good conductors. Uh, and based on their price sort of dictates, uh, or the other way around, uh, how conductive they are. Um, so like gold is a very, very good conductor, um, but it's not, it's not practical for us to make all of our power lines uh, out of gold. Even though uh, if, if, all of, if I could wave my magic wand and make all of our power lines gold, um, the amount of power that we would be receiving at home would be much, which would be much greater than what's at the power stations. And we could actually power down some power stations um, and you know, help, help preserve the environment a little bit. But the thing is that we don't have enough gold to make that practical. I mean, there's plenty of asteroids that are orbiting the Earth that have enough gold to be able to do that. Um, but they're not down here yet. They're still, they're still up there. Um, and so we sort of have to prioritize. There's this, this fine balance of um, what's, what's cheap, but what's still conductive enough to do the job. And so, um, and the power lines that we typically use, we use aluminum. Uh, because it's fairly cheap um, and it's fairly conductive. Uh, and then in a household, we use copper, which is a little bit more expensive and is, is a great deal more conductive. And the reason being is that, you know, a household, you want to have a little bit better quality uh, wiring than what's outside. Um, because, you know, if, it, if something happens in your house, it's your fault. So you tend to you know, invest a little bit more. And inside the house, you know, the, the, the wires that are inside the walls, any kind of efficiency that you lose during power transmission uh, is typically, uh, dumped, uh, is typically uh, dumped as heat energy. And you don't want um, the power lines that are in your walls uh, to be heating up uh, because you risk catching the house on fire. Versus the power lines that we have outside, um, those, that, those have plenty of opportunity to have lots of cooling because there's you know, wind blowing by pretty much all the time um, to, to cool them down. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so that's, that's why we, we tend to use aluminum is because it's cheaper. It's always being cooled um, as opposed to copper, uh, which, is, which is, there's much less of it, but we use that in our households because we want to have something that's, that's fairly efficient at, at transmitting energy, but we don't quite want to you know, bl blow out the bank on, on using gold or silver um, to line all of our, our power lines in our house. Um, but we see gold used uh, in very expensive electronics, uh, like rovers, because the rovers are getting as much, you know, like, like Mars, uh, Mars rovers and satellites, we use as much gold as possible because it doesn't degrade. It holds up very, very well, um, and it's very conductive, and, and um, yeah, we, we, we definitely care about as much efficiency as possible, and we don't want to lose any efficiency uh, to heat. Um, because in a lot of cases, um, we already have uh, enough heat that we have to deal with when we're in space and getting rid of the heat is one of the bigger problems. Um, and so we try to use gold, we, we use gold where it's practical as well as silver. Um, and so 
Yeah, and the cheaper the metals are, essentially the less conductive we get. And we have then this middle zone, uh, pencils use graphite, uh, which is essentially a resistor. That, it's, that it, is, it is a conductor, it sort of works, um, but that it generates a little bit of heat uh, when, when you try to use it as a wire. Uh, and so you can actually, on a piece of paper, draw out a circuit diagram with a pencil and actually connect components to that. Uh, and there's pencils that you can buy that are even more expensive than a normal pencil, where they sprinkle in you know, this, this aluminum and silver and copper and gold, depending on how rich you are, into the graphite, and that makes them even more conductive um, and make, makes it even more, work even better. Then you have things that we don't really consider to be conductive, uh, and we call them insulators. So we think of like plastics and, and glass um, as, and rubber as being really good insulators. Um, the thing though is that the higher the voltage is, the less effective this is. So for example, if you went to say 30,000 volts, you could definitely um, have electricity flow over a toothpick. Um, and so we don't wanna just think of insulators as just, they immediately block the electricity. They just are really good at blocking electricity. Because even air, like the air that we breathe, is conductive if power, if, if the voltage is high enough. Um, and so like if you've seen, if you've seen like a giant Tesla coil, like the ones that, you know, play music, um, that's using air, which we consider air as an insulator uh, most of the time, but because the Tesla coil's voltage is so high, um, it's able to transmit over it. But if, yeah, if you connected metal, it would happily use the metal instead of the air because the metal um, is a much better conductor. So just being a conductor means that the electrons want to flow through you and you and the better quality of a conductor you are the less the less power that you lose to heat of course insulators where you pretty much lose it immediately to heat um unless you bump up the voltage and yeah as i said resistors they are somewhere in between the conductor and insulator they offer resistance and they convert they convert it to heat um, um when when so you were saying that it could like electricity could flow through insulators. Is that that kind of like ion, ionization through the air? Like does it ionize through the toothpick or um I never mind. Actually never mind. Actually, yeah. Okay. Um but like wood, there's there's some really good examples where they clamp wood um that, like on either side, like people make tables or they'll clamp wood on either side and they'll apply very, very high voltage. And you actually get these really cool lightning strikes that go through the wood and then they like fill them with epoxy to make them really look really nifty. Um, and what happens actually is that the carbon, when after you've burnt the wood, becomes is, is even more conductive than the wood. And so you end up getting um, sort of this chain reaction uh, when you apply a whole uh, a high voltage to, to, uh, to it because it ends up burning it out. Um, but yeah, essentially, the, the and, and you can think of the electrons as they're traveling along the surface. And so the higher the voltage is, the, the easier they are able to travel along the surface of whatever the item is. Um, so a great, great prank uh, to do is uh, if you have a generator that generates 30,000 volts, which I have a few, um, you can hook it up to like a table, just like a plastic table that somebody has, and charge it up and then disconnect and hide the equipment really quick. And if somebody happens to, in, la, in, in the next like three minutes or so, goes by and goes to touch this plastic table, they can actually get shocked by it. Um, but that the environment dissipates pretty quickly um, because the insulator doesn't, doesn't like to have electrons traveling along it or hanging out too long. So it, it tends to dissipate it pretty quickly. Okay. Okay, uh, Carter. That's information for information for print for crying out for crying out. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, circuits. So uh, let's talk about circuits, and we're gonna use that water analogy because uh, we're just gonna use that water analogy. Um. So an open circuit is a circuit where this this open air where it's exposed to open air. 
where the circuit isn't continuous, it's not connected, the circuit is off, the light is off, but there's this gap. A closed circuit is where the loop is closed, where there's no air, it's able to flow, it's able to flow through, and that means that the light's on and we get electricity. So flowing, flowing is good, that means that we have electricity, not flowing is bad, we don't have electricity. Um, and so here, uh, is this open or closed? Open. 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 Yeah, exactly. It's open. We can see that this the switch is open. There's this air gap between it, which means that this LED is not going to light up. And so, yeah. So, so, and. Um, if if we were to close if we were to close the switch, then it's a closed circuit, and then the light will light up. Um, and there are two ways that we can that we uh, that we arrange circuitry. Um, and we sort of mix them. No, there are two general ways, and then we mix them together to to create more complex uh, circuits. Um, and we and we uh, use a series and parallel. Um, and, and we can think of them just like you know, TV, you know, TV series or a book series or like parallel universes or whatever. It, the meaning is exactly the same. Series means one after another. So in this, in this circuit layout, it goes from the battery to the resistor to the LED to the switch to the battery. Right? That's, that's in series. Whereas parallel is all of the things at the same time. And I'll show you a picture. Here's, here's the difference between ser a series circuit and a parallel circuit. Um, for two lights and a, and a battery. So you notice that series, it's one after another, and that the voltage is halved. Essentially what happens is that in series, they share the voltage, they, they half the voltage. So this gets half of 1.5 and this one gets the other half of 1.5. Whereas parallel, these guys share the, they share the current but they get the same voltage. So this one gets 1.5 volts and this one gets 1.5 volts. And so this is a way that maybe you have an LED, you have a light that runs on 1.5, right? You're gonna, you're gonna organize it as a parallel circuit. If you organize it as a series circuit, it would be very dim or it wouldn't work at all. Um, and so you can sort of mix these two things with different kinds of components. So for example, if I was to put a switch right here, uh, what would that, what would that allow us to do? We could, um, we could, um, control the control second, the second. Light. Yeah, exactly. That would allow us to control the second LED. The first LED or the, yeah, the first, the first light would stay, would stay running but adding yet another component right here would allow us to, to, to toggle this on and off. Maybe you have like a security light or something that, you know, as long as the battery has a charge, you want that light to continue working, but that you have, you, but you ultimately have a light that, you know, a, a switch that controls the main light that is like the flashlight. Maybe you have a flashlight that has a little dim light that always is on as long as the battery's good, but then you have your main light and you stick a switch right here to turn it on or off. Something like that, that you can then you can pretty quickly add components um, and add complexity and make something more and more useful. Okay. All right. So yeah, I just want to want to nail this down. Closed circuit. It's closed. Electrons are able to flow. They go through the LED. They light up. And actually, just occurred to me this LED is backwards. <laughs> Kind of fix that uh, versus an open circuit. So the physical the physical pins where the LED is is, is needs to be on the other side, um, and then an open circuit. There's no electricity flowing because it's open. There's this air gap here, and so there's no electrons flowing. They're just hanging out where they were, um, and there are tons of electrons. This whole wire has electrons all in them. But what happens is that when you close this, they all they all start bumping into each other and pushing each other, um, 
all the way through. And so actually the power company, uh, because we have alternating current at home, um, all you're doing is when you're paying the bill, all they're doing is they're putting electrons on either side of the wire, um, shifting it back and forth. And so by the end of the day, you maybe have one or negative one electrons from what you started with. Um, but that, that ultimately all they're doing is shifting electrons that you already have in the house and all of your wires just back and forth. Um, but with a battery with current electricity, the electrons are actually going from one side of the battery to the other side of the battery. Okie dokie. Uh, this would have been an activity that we would have done in class, but unfortunately we are not in class. Um, this would have, this is a foam board. So this is non-conductive and there's some pipe it tips. Um, these we would stab into the foam and we would roll this tin foil um, onto the cardboard and we would essentially make our own circuits with tin foil, which is aluminum. Um, and we would connect up the battery and the lights and make a switch and we would have a circuit. Uh, so yeah, that's what we would have done. Uh, just to give you an appreciation for what, what could have happened. Sorry guys. Okay, we are not doing Elmo. Okay, uh, any questions about electrical engineering? Before I move on. No questions, thanks. No questions, thanks. What was that, Nathan? I didn't have a specific question. I didn't have a specific question. Uh, that was interesting. Thank uh, you. That was interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, okay, so let's let's migrate on to the the computer realm. All right. So let's talk about uh, computer science, computer information, and computer engineering. All right. Um, and so these are very distinct things. Uh, they 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 have their own line for a reason. Um, because they are very different disciplines, um, very different degrees. Um, and one of the most unfortunate things is that they don't talk to each other. Um, a lot of times, computer scientists, computer information specialists, and computer engineers don't talk to each other. Um, and the issues that one of them may think, may know that something's possible, and that might be what they do, and another one thinks that something's impossible, uh, and if, if it was possible, that would have, you know, that would totally solve the problems that they're, that they're running into. Um, uh, I, I have a story, uh, three, three years ago, I was uh, up, up in San Francisco at a conference, uh, RSA, it's a cybersecurity conference, there's about 30,000 30, people there. And I was in a booth um, for a networking company that was building uh, networking equipment to, to secure, uh, to just secure normal businesses, but they were doing a demo for uh, embedded uh, industrial control systems. Uh, so their demo had like, it was like a brewery where they, where that they had set up. Um, and I was asking them about, about something about running on embedded systems. And, and they're like, Oh yeah, our, our stuff doesn't actually run on this equipment. Um, but we really wish that it did, but it's just, it's just not possible. And literally the booth 10 feet away that's what they did is that they were able to migrate solutions like what they had um, to be on an embedded system on, on onto the system that would allow them uh, to be able to sell and be able to secure uh, those markets to be, to be able to secure those um, those industrial control systems uh, so that they could actually secure a brewery or uh, a water piping system or a water treatment plant or something like that, uh, that they had thought was impossible, um, but it really was possible. And then I literally grabbed the engineer's hand and walked them 10 feet over to the other booth and then introduced them to their engineer. Uh, and they hopefully were able to make a, a really cool product together um, by, by working together, but just, um, just ha helping people sort of cr uh, cross pollinate and talking to each other is really key. Um, if you're working for a company, um, being able to converse with the other people of the other ba of the different backgrounds is really really important, uh, and it can also help you and, and the other people feel a lot more valuable because um, it helps you appreciate the piece of the puzzle that you provide and maybe the piece of puzzle that they provide and and helps them see where everything fits together. Um, so communication is really really important, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and so you're I mean you're taking this engineering as a profession class. You've been doing uh, hopefully some group work um, and, and learning what it what it looks like to, to work as a team. So 
now you're not just hearing it from Roxanne, you're hearing it from me, um, that teamwork is really, really important. Um, so yeah, so let's, 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 let's go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So from phones to cars to medicine, technology touches every part of our lives. If we can create technology, we can change the world. So if we can build solutions to problems that we see, whether it's you know, fixing the structure of a bridge, we can change the world. Um, and you know, sometimes just picking up a single piece of trash, we, we don't realize the, the kind of ramifications that it can have. So it's really important to be as really mindful uh, of our impact um, on our environment and, and, try to, and try to change it for the better. So I just want to give you guys a, a quick history lesson so we can really appreciate uh, how we got to where we are today. So uh, the first person I like to talk about is Ada Lovelace. Um, she wrote the first algorithm for machines and she's regarded as the first computer programmer. Um, she essentially came up with the idea that you could have input for a machine, maybe like a lever or a button or a switch or something like that, and that that if you interacted with that, you could change the behavior how, of how the machine worked and that you could do it in a very predictable way. Given this input, the, the machine would behave in this fashion. Um, and that's what we, and, and that's regarded as a computer nowadays. You press a key on a keyboard that there's a very, there's a very explicitly given um, result of that based on whatever you're doing. Uh, so we can thank Ada for, for that concept. The next person I like to talk about is Grace Mori Hopper. Um, so she invented the first compiler. And what that does is that converts something that is somewhat human readable into something that the computer can understand. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that in the next slide. And then she also invented the concept of machine independent programming. Uh, one of the issues was you know, before her was that you would program something once and it would only work on that one machine. Literally, you had so, an, a machine that was almost identical, like from the same manufacturer, you know, and there was, these were supercomputers back then. We didn't have personal computers. Um, you know, a, a computer that was pretty much the same specs, made by the same manufacturer, and is literally built right next door in, in the other three-story building. Um, those two computers weren't compatible. And if you wrote code for one, it wouldn't work on the other. Um, because just maybe the you know, how somebody soldered uh, the, the memory rings together uh, was enough that would, would cause, a, cause the computer were vastly different. And so uh, Grace uh, helped us solve that problem by essentially make, making it so that you could program something once and it would run in multiple spots. It would run on multiple machines. We take this for granted, right? There are, there are thousands of different kinds of Android phones uh, and we download some generic app that was maybe programmed on not even an Android phone, maybe it was only programmed on a computer and tested on a computer, but was never tested on a phone. And that application works on all of these different kinds of phones. Um, and that really goes to machine ind independent programming is that you can write a program in general form that will allow you to use that, that code on lots of different kinds of um, devices. And then to add to her badassery, um, she was the first programmer of the Harvard Mark I computer. Um, essentially, there was this giant computer that was built to, uh, to calculate missile trajectories, and no one could figure out how to make it do anything besides basic addition. Um, they had spent, you know, I think due to inflation, that would have been billions of dollars um, on building this, you know, this multi-story building um, computer and doesn't, didn't do anything uh, practically. And so they brought her in and she no problem, was you know, able to write some code for it and, um, and was able to get it operational for, for calculating missile launches. Um, but yeah, just, just the fact that they, they had built this giant computer and they couldn't figure out how to, how to make it do anything useful. Um, nowadays, right, we, we buy a computer, we build a, you know, build a computer and we're pretty much, we're able to plug in some cards, load in some software and we're off to the races. Um, so the days of, of having to bring in a specialist to, to program up a computer um, are, are pretty much over um, for, for that. So yeah, badass mofo, Grace, Grace Murray Hopper. Thank you very much for solving all those problems. And we'll, we'll, talk, about, we'll, we'll talk about compilers. 
Uh, but first, let's get some number bases down. Um, so we should hopefully all be familiar with base 10. Oh, my pointer vanished again. There we, go. we should all be familiar with base 10. But this is, this is how we count normally. Um, we call the decimal system. And one of the things to be mindful about is that when we say base and then a number, what we're saying is that per a digit, per a specific location, we can express this many things. So in base 10, from, uh, we can express in one digit spot 0 through 9. And what happens is that when we run out of things that we can express, because this is 10 different things, 0 through 9, is that we then make the 0 and then we carry the 1 over. And so we have 10. That's how base 10 works. Now in binary, if I can move this, can I move this? Uh, whatever. So I, I don't know, can, can you guys see the one that's right here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, I, I have something that's blocking it. So um, it's good that you can see it. Okay, so, um, so in base two, you notice how uh, base two, we can only express two different things per location. So we go zero, one, and then we're out. We now have to go to zero, go to zero, and then carry the one over, uh, and then there we go. We, we, we're now at one zero. And if we add one to this, we have one one. So in each position, and then if we need to add one more to this, we're out of, we're out of spots. So we, we set both of these to zero and we carry the one, and then we're at, we're at one zero zero. So in binary, it's much quicker that you start carry things over because you only have two spots. Um, and it's very, very difficult for us to look at lots and lots of ones and zeros. And so what we do that's easier on our eyes is we're able to convert this base two into base 16. And base 16 is the same concept, that 16 is the number of different things that we can express in one digit location. So zero through F. And so when we hit normally decimal in base 10, right, because it's 10 things, we, we stop at nine and then we have to go to 10. But in base 16, after F would actually be one zero. So the, the equivalent of 16 in decimal in base would be one zero. Um, but the nifty thing about base 16 is for, for those of you who know the, the powers of two, uh, 16, is, 16 is a power of two. And that allows us this relationship where the biggest number with four, four digits or four bits in binary, we can store as a single digit. We can store that as a single digit in base 16. And it's much, much easier to look at this one letter or, or number, you know, this basic, this hex thing, um, then looking at all of these ones and zeros. Um, so yeah, we consider hex to be easier for our eyes. And so it's purely made for, for humans. You may have seen hex used uh, when we're talking about colors, um, like when we're doing design for uh, design work for a website or, or any kind of graphical design that we use this hex um, we use this hex to uh, use colors because we're able to express a lot more colors. Um, but also uh, in the back, on the back end, how the color is actually stored on the computer uh, is in binary. And so we use this, we're able to take this hex and convert it to binary very easily. Uh, and there is a such thing as a, a ternary computer or base three, that would be uh, you know, zero, one, and two, or, or negative one, zero, and one uh, that had three states. Uh, the Russians made it in, in, during the Cold War. The problem is that it was so radical that uh, people couldn't figure out how to make it work, and so they ended up abandoning the project. Uh, but it is possible. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about bits later. Um, okay, so now let's actually talk about what Grace Maria Hopper gave to us. Um, there are these things called compilers, and they allow us to essentially take things that are human readable um, like human, like hello world. So these are different compilers and environments. So not all of these necessarily use a compiler, but the same concept holds. Um, 
that we write something like echo hello world or see out hello world or print hello world or print hello world or system out out hello world. Um, these are all relatively human readable. We can look at them and have an understanding of what's going to happen. Uh, and the compiler takes this and it then converts it to this machine language, something that the computer, that the processor can understand. And this here is in, it, this here is in hex, it's in base 16, because um, it's much easier for our eyes. But also if I was to, if I was to show you what all the bit, what, what all the ones and zeros look like, if I did this in binary, if I just took this, this first, this first block here, the, the four, these four uh, uh, hex, hex digits and converted it to binary, we would get what's down here, down below. We get all of these ones and zeros. And so if I was just to convert this, I don't know, we'll call it a paragraph of hex, if we were converted to binary, it would take up three pages. Um, and so that's really hard to look at, especially if you have a bit flip. If, if one of those, if one of these ones and zeros gets flipped because of some mistake somewhere, um, we would very easily see that bit flip here in this nice little paragraph. Uh, then if we were to look at all these ones and zeros and trying to figure out where did one flip. So yeah, we don't really have to consider, we don't really have to concern ourselves with these. If you take a computer architecture class, then yeah, you need to be able to read, if, if you were handed this piece here, you'd need to be able to read, oh yeah, this is a syscall here. Um, but that's only for like one class that you that you really need to be concerned with. And for some reason, if for some reason you really like looking at stuff like this, and understanding how this here gets converted into this thing, and this I actually made myself. This this is code that I, this is code that I wrote that does print hello world. Um, this isn't just a jumble of things. This is actually real code that I wrote. Um, but if for some reason you really like doing this, figuring out why this works, uh, there's a lot of money out there for for you um, because a lot of people don't like to do this. Um, and so th there's some really cool problems to solve or uh, the opportunity to be able to reinvent the wheel uh, with the knowledge that we have about how computers work nowadays. Um, that gives us an opportunity to not have to use just really old code that's been laying around forever because nobody understands it and being able to rewrite it. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in that, uh, go get a job. <laughs> there's a lot of money for you. Um, but yeah, a compiler converts things that are it's human readable into something that the machine can understand. It looks more like this. Uh, and computers used to look like this. You would spend thousands and thousands of dollars and you would spend all of this time programming it. And if you could get it to blink a little light or display something on a screen, you were pretty satisfied. Um, now we spend, you know, just a few hundred bucks on a phone that's able to play video games, is able to you know, talk to people, is able to text, is able to go on social medias and all kinds of, do all kinds of fancy stuff. And um, you would not be willing to spend a thousand dollars, you know, $5,000 on something that just blinks a little light after you spend months working on it. Um, so uh, very appreciative that somebody else uh, had to do that before me um, and that we don't have to do that. Uh, but yeah, as a, as a hobby, this stuff, this kind of stuff is cool. Um, and originally, our code used to be on these punch cards that we used to physically have to put holes in paper in order to code things. Um, so essentially, these ones and zeros here would have been physical holes or not holes in this piece of paper. And what happens if you lost a single piece of paper or that the machine, when you're feeding it in, accidentally ate one of the pieces of paper? or maybe you dropped a stack of them and now they're out of order, uh, you would be pretty miserable. Um, and so there was actually a language that the, the whole point of the language was that as long as you had the first punch card uh, that you could feed in all of the subsequent punch cards in any order, and that was revolutionary um, because each of the punch cards had an ID on them that could be scanned and that would tell, uh, essentially the first card would say, I'm gonna use this much memory and then all of the subsequent punch cards would essentially say, hey, I'm ID blah, 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 put me in this spot in memory. Um, and so as long as you had the first one, you were okay. Um, but that's, that's, we're way past that. But a lot of the code, the vestigial structure uh, still exists. Um, sometimes when we're using a text editor, uh, we can actually open up and see that they're, the addresses that they used for punch cards is still actually in our editors, um, a lot of that a lot of that code is still there uh, to to deal with these. 
uh, and they'll stick around for probably ever um, until we re you know, until we reinvent the wheel again. Um, yeah, so it's just something to be mindful about. Okay, so this is yet another activity that we would have done, um, but I'll just I'll just sort of do a brief brief overview of, of what it, what it, what it would have looked like. Um, so there's this thing called ASCII, and it's essentially a standard for um, for every kind of any kind of uh, thing that you do on the keyboard, um, or more importantly, when it was invented on a typewriter or a teletypewriter. Um, and so there's things, for example, in ASCII like carriage return. Um, if you've ever seen somebody use a, a typewriter, that's that where they do that swing, where that the top of the typewriter sort of swings uh, to one from one side to the other, and that there's this dinging sound that that occurs. Um, that's actually still in, that is still in ASCII, and that will probably stay in ASCII for for a very long time. And Brox told me to stop on the pranks, but a great prank is that you can actually send somebody a file with that bell character, with that carriage return in the bell character, or just the bell character, um, and different systems will render it differently. Some computers will actually still make a beeping sound um, when they receive that bell character. Um, and that lives, and that, and that is something that's inside the ASCII. Um, but in this case, we're just dealing with uh, lowercase things, uh, A through Z. But if we wanted to make this lowercase, we would take this third bit right here, and we would set that to zero, and then all of these would be uppercase. So this third bit here, if this was zero, would be a, a capital Z. The reason being is that uh, originally typewriters uh, only had the alphabet and uppercase, and uppercase was first. Later on, when we added, when we were adding bits, suddenly we had more functionality. Now we added this third bit, or, or, I mean, this, you know, this um, uh, sixth bit, and so then we now had the ability to have uppercase and lowercase. And then we added these two more bits and that allowed us to have, you know, parentheses and curly braces and, and square brackets and, and dollar signs and all kinds of extra symbols um, because we had more address space to work with. Um, but what we would have done in the activity is that you would, I would have given everybody a bit and we I would have uh, played a metronome that would go tick tock. Um, and then you would have transmitted a message across across the room. Uh, and I'm sorry that we can't do that. Okay, last two people I, I like to talk about. Um, so we have Anita Borg. Uh, and so she worked at Xerox PARC. She, um, she was the chief researcher uh, at Xerox PARC. And she, uh, she worked on the mouse and on, oh. Can everyone still hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Still hear you. Um, okay. Cool. My my Zoom just froze up and then came back. Okay. Um, so yeah. So Nita Borg was a chief researcher at Xerox Park. She worked on the mouse, um, uh, like the mouse, like the the pointer device that we use. Um, and then she also worked on uh, Ethernet. She was the chief researcher for for Ethernet, which is the protocol that we use to essentially con connect all of our phones and all of our computers to, to the internet. But Ethernet is also the physical wire that allows us to plug in our computers uh, into having internet. Um, and so she, she worked on that. Uh, she also is the inventor of uh, fault tolerant Unix based operating systems. Uh, what that means is that before, before her, uh, if you wrote a bad program, you would take out the server, you would take out the physical computer. And these were big computers that were shared amongst lots and lots of people. Um, and it took hours, like minimum four hours to get these machines running again if somebody ran a bad program. And so she invented the, the, an operating system that essentially could handle bad programs. That if it detected, if the operating system detected that the program was doing something bad, it would then go and kill the program before the program could kill the computer. Um, that's why when we get like programs not responding, why we're still able to like move our mouses around and like open up a task manager and, and do things like that is because we're dealing with operating systems that are relatively fault tolerant, that they can handle bad things happening and they can recover from that. Uh, she also invented the, um, the idea um, of mass emailing. Originally emails used to be just between one person and another person and that was it. 
you couldn't, if you wanted to send an email out to a group of people, you literally had to just make that same message and copy and paste it to each individual person. Uh, and that was quite tedious um, because of the systems at the time, uh, you, you couldn't easily copy and paste things. Um, it, it, took, it took a bit. Um, and then she also founded the Institute for uh, Women in Technology. Okay, last person I like to talk about, Margaret Hamilton. So um, she was the lead developer for the Apollo flight uh, computer. And right here, this is a stack of code that her and her team uh, wrote. And you notice that this, and, and this is handwritten code. Uh, there are no mistakes here. I mean, I haven't seen students with typed code not make any mistakes. Um, and, and actually, I was, I was just watching um, a video uh, by Curious Mark. Uh, he, he lives over the hill. Um, he just posted yesterday where he had got his hands on one of these books and they were, they were practically drooling over it, looking through the code because it's just so immaculate, even though it's all handwritten. Um, and, and, and Margaret is really to blame for how good the, the, the code quality is. It's her foresight for errors, for how mistakes could happen, how sensors could misbehave or, or um, you know, how they could break or be misread or human error could occur. Um, and being able to write code to be able to handle those circumstances, uh, which is really important and why I regard her as, as a real engineer, even though she's technically a computer scientist, she's, she's really an engineer because she, she thought about how things were being used um, and, and, and how to prevent them from, from breaking um, and having that foresight for errors and really is the reason why we landed on the moon multiple times. Um, and that this idea of, of just, you know, how could an error occur? Or how could we prevent somebody from being malicious? We should think about no matter what we're doing, if we're an engineer developing a bridge, we should not just think about like, let's make the bridge as strong as possible. And let's make it robust to if somebody was to pull out a bolt somewhere on the bridge, that the whole bridge just wouldn't collapse, um, that, it could, that it could handle uh, a little bit of malicious intent. Um, so that, I think that's a really important sort of mental framework to hold is how, how it, through general use uh, is whatever I'm doing going to be used and how is it going to be robust to handle those circumstances. But also if somebody is being malicious, um, how can we build our system, whether it's a bridge or if it's code, uh, to be able to put up with uh, things going awry. Um, or if just, you know, components are failing, uh, things break, sensors, uh, sensors have defects. Um, and then how do we how do we handle those those kinds of circumstances and thinking about that uh, ahead of time versus you know on the spur of the moment the Apollo flight computer there wasn't I mean there was some of the spur of the moment stuff but all of those like all of those emergency codes that they were typing into the Apollo flight computer that was already all programmed onto the computer to be able to handle those circumstances the 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 astronauts essentially just had to tell the computer hey we've hit this case. Go handle the code. Go handle that circumstance based on the code that you were already pre-programmed with. Um, and then Margaret Hamilton was also um, the, the developer for Project Sage, which originally was uh, was for uh, detecting um, missiles being launched. We now use uh, seismometers for, for for doing that kind of detection. But now uh, Project Sage, almost 50 years later, um, that is how we do all of our weather predictions. Um, so if, if you're ever frustrated at the weatherman being off by 15 minutes of when it's gonna rain, uh, just keep in mind that the code that's doing all that prediction is almost 50 years old. Um, so somebody should probably rewrite that at some point, um, but it continues to still work, uh, which is a real tribute to, to Margaret. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a bit of a history lesson. Hopefully that gives us a bit of an appreciation for uh, how we got to where we are today. All right. Okay, let's talk about bits. So we already saw with binary that with one bit, we can hold the values one and zero, and that's it. We can hold two distinct values. Um, but we live in excellent times. We live in this quantum state where we have things called p-bits. How many values do we have between zero and one? A quick 
quick refresher from, from algebra. Endless, endless. What, what was that, Jessica? You have an endless amount. You have of, an endless amount of one. Yeah, we, we have an infinite amount of, of values between zero and one. Um, but for some reason, the physicists were not satisfied. That you know, an infinite amount of, of, of values that we could hold wasn't good enough. So the thing that we see in the news and we read about all the time because it's more sexy are qubits. So qubits we can think of as uh, in polar coordinates, it's like a point on the sphere, anywhere on the sphere, and there's any distance from the sphere, and then it's a vector, it's like an arrow that's pointing in any direction along the sphere. So that's something more like eight infinity, which last time I checked is still infinity. Um, and these qubits are really cool. Everybody's building, everybody and their brother and their uncles and whatnot, got to have a quantum computer. Um, you know, we see all the Googles, we see the IBMs, uh, we see the, the D-Wave, we, we see all these big companies either building or buying lots of quantum computers. We see governments buying thousands of these. Right now, they're not very particularly useful uh, because they're not stable. Um, one of the issues, and this is an engineering issue, that we need more HVAC engineers, is that um, qubits, we have to keep them chilled. We have to keep them very, very cold in order for them to be stable. And right now, our HVAC technology is not good enough um, to be able to keep these stable for more than four, four hours or so. Um, and then they lose their values. They lose the data that they were holding with them. Um, so that's, so all of you are relatively young. Um, so hopefully within our lifetimes, we're going to see uh, the usage of qubits uh, increase. And hopefully some of you will be part of solving the problems of making them more stable, because um, that's definitely a problem. But now imagine, let's just imagine that we're in a world where they're stable. Suddenly now you have the ability to transmit infinite amounts of data instantaneously, because you're able to take these qubits, you can take two of them, and you can do something called quantum entangling where you essentially connect two qubits to each other um, over vast distances, and whatever happens to one of the qubits will affect the other qubit. So imagine that you have a walkie-talkie that has a, a, a paired qubit you know, a, a, with, with, with another qubit that's, that's in another walkie-talkie. You're now able to essentially talk uh, instantaneously to somebody with an infinite amount of data uh, anywhere. And so imagine that when we have these cave-ins that happen and we're not sure if anyone survived, if somebody just, and, and the rock is too thick to get a radio signal through, if you just had a qubit radio that you could just whip out uh, and be able to talk to people and let them know your, your, your situation, that would be pretty nifty. Um, or to, to be able to have instantaneous communication uh, with, you know, Mars or whatnot, uh, because right now there's there's uh, quite a delay back and forth. I mean, even in Zoom, we're all in the same uh, same county for the most part, and we still have a, a significant delay um, using traditional bits flying along uh, copper wires in, in the air. Uh, so if we had qubits uh, that were entangled and they were stable, we could transmit all of this information instantaneously. Uh, so it would be really cool to see that I hope some of you uh, go on to be engineers and can solve that problem for me so that I don't have lag in my in my Zoom sessions. That would be pretty nifty. Uh, any questions about qubits? Okay, seeing none, moving on. All right, let's talk about the, the various fields um, that I had introduced beforehand. Um, so we have computer science. Oh, Rox, Rox is talking again. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. Okay, well, then I'll meet you. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, the first field is computer science, um, which is essentially we're taking existing hardware and we're making it do 
useful things. Um, using symbols. We're essentially able to type out symbols that the computer is able to understand, and then that causes it to be able to do extra things with whatever the hardware is. Um, so a computer scientist isn't physically building a computer or anything like that. They're taking some existing hunk of hardware and they're essentially putting a ton of symbols on it uh, that allow it to then do things that are hopefully useful. Versus computer information, uh, which is more of, of, a, of a general sort of umbrelling thing uh, that deals with computers. Um, this, this covers everything from uh, IT to hackers, to networking individuals, uh, to, to tech managers, um, chief technical officers, chief security officers, uh, system administrators, um, all of that uh, is under the umbrella of computer information. And so computer security is under that umbrella. And this is the world that I live in. Um, and so each of these little balls of, of color that's flying back and forth is an attack. It is one or multiple computers attacking another computer. And the intent in all of these cases is malicious. Whether it's you know, one country fighting another country, whether it's a, uh, you know, somebody in their basement trying to steal somebody else's credit card information, um, that these, that these are all malicious in some way. Uh, whether you're trying to destabilize a, a centrifuge that makes nuclear material, right? We would see that as one of these little colored balls flying from one thing to another. Uh, we're not firing missiles at each other anymore. That, that kind of war is, is long, long over. This is the kind of war that we see now where one country attacks another with data with trying to either prevent things from working um, or try to break things or uh, try to extract information uh, from a computer that has valuable information. Um, and imagine because nowadays we have you know, computerized so much thing, you know, so, so much of things, uh, all of our, our infrastructure, our water pipe systems, our, uh, our gas lines, the things that turn those lines on and off that's all computer powered and there's absolutely no protection on those systems. If you know the address of, of, of a water shutoff valve, you can literally, any person at home could send a command to that water pump, to, to that water valve to turn on and off or, or even the water pump, the, the valve and the pump. Um, and if you know something about the size of the pipe and the length of the pipe, you can actually pulse it on and off to cause it to explode. So now you're destroying, you know, over the internet, you're destroying something physically with just telling something to turn on and off. And that would be very, very hard to trace uh, who did that with the current way that our infrastructure is built. Um, and so this is, that's what I do is I try to prevent uh, or mitigate these attacks, um, trying to build an infrastructure that's robust and can handle people being malicious and people trying to damage things. Um, yeah, so that's the world we live in. Not to be all super doomsday, but uh, we should be we should be mindful. You know, people are walking around with pacemakers that are connected to the internet um, that pretty much anyone can log into and tell it to you know cause a few extra shocks to stop somebody's heart, or um, an insulin pump that would cause them you know tell the pump to stop working or tell it to to give a few extra shots to somebody and, and end up taking them out, um, and so we should be very mindful that this is the kind of situation that we live in today. Uh, cars, they're connected to the internet. There was um, a reporter for Wired Magazine who uh, was curious on you know, how easily his car could be hacked. And he gave permission to two, uh, two guys that worked at Twitter um, who were in a different state at the time uh, to go and hack his car. And they proceeded to remotely from a different state hack into his car changed the picture uh, on his on, on, on the stereo to a picture of their faces and then engaged the cruise control in the car, locked him out of the car, and then drove him into a ditch. He was perfectly fine. I mean, he was a little bit scared at how easily, how easy they, it, it was for them. 
Um, but any modern car uh, made in the last 20 years uh, and made in the next 10 years is going to have that same kind of vulnerability. Uh, so yeah, just be careful when you're buying new cars. Um, <laughs> everything's connected to the internet. Um, Sorry, and if somebody has a question. malicious, if so, yeah, what's up? Oh, uh, I got a question. So I assume in the next, you know, 10 years, you know, Apple, Samsung, they're going to come out with the the phones that you implant in your head. Um, so from what you're saying, you would recommend not doing that. <laughs> I, I never said that. So I think that we should be mindful about this okay. and, and how, okay. and how these things are being used. Um, I mean, I, I actually like the idea of being able to have my electronics on me um, and integrated into me. You know, if that means that I don't have to charge my phone uh, every two days, that would be pretty sweet. Um, mm. Mm. If it was able just to run off the, the heat that my body was generating, but that it's that the, the rights that I have as an individual who maybe would be implanted um, are very important. So for example, I have a few friends who have cochlear implants um, they are uh, implants that allow you to sort of hear. Um, the, the, they, have, they essentially put incisions in the cochlear nerve and then put these wires in, into your into your brain into your brain that allow you to, to sense sound information. Um, and one of the biggest problems that I have with it is that pretty much all of the companies who are manufacturers of it do not allow people to ha have any knowledge of the kind of the chip or any of the code. Um, that's running inside their brain um, or even outside on the external part of the component. And so I had a friend that he was in a wrestling, um, a wrestling match and he, got an, and he got a knee to the implant that was inside of his skull and damaged it. And uh, when they went to repair it, they didn't repair it properly. And he tried to get information on, you know, how can I go back to the old code? Because they, they had uploaded new firmware that was uh, that didn't work um, and caused him you know, extreme headaches. And the company was just like, well, you're going to run the new thing, deal with it. That he had no rights in the situation of the code that was literally uploaded to a chip that was in his brain. That's a problem now. That's a problem today. Um, so something just to be really careful of is that the companies of whatever implants that we're, what we might be putting into us, if we're putting our cell phone into us, um, that we probably should have some say. Um, Apple uh, is notorious for trying to keep things secret, um, but very easy to guess. Um, so like uh, one of their most recent operating systems that they released, they had an encryption key that was literally like, Apple Corporation is on Stevens Creek and Bub. That's literally what the, the encryption key was. And that was something that somebody was eventually able to guess and figure out and crack. Um, versus uh, Google, I, I at least applaud them, even though they're not supporting the don't be evil. Um, but Android, you at least have the option of downloading the source code yourself and uploading it to yourself, which allows you a lot more transparency to the kind of code that you're running you know, on your devices, whether it's inside or outside of your body. Um, so something to be mindful is the kinds of things that you are allowing close to you, if it's pacemakers or insulin pumps or whatever, that the companies are allowing people to look at them and to fix the problems um, and that they're being as transparent as possible um, because not everybody is. Uh, any other questions about uh, computer information? And, and when we talk about robots, I'll, I'll actually talk uh, a little bit more about um, about those those topics. Um, okay, so then the last one is computer engineering. Uh, computer engineering is essentially merging all of those fields that we've already talked about together. It's merging the electrical engineering part it's, it's merging the computer science part, it's, it's merging the computer information studies part. Um, and yeah, requires a great deal of knowledge in all of them. So you have all your, you have all of your fingers and all various different soups. Um, 
and uh, it pays very, very well, um, but requires a great deal of schooling. Uh, does anyone know what this thing is on the top right of the screen? This, this blob here. And actually, let's go back to my pointer. This blob here. This is the processor architecture for PlayStation 1. That's it. That's all it is. You know, something that's able to do some addition and subtraction, uses the subtraction with the sine extender, and it does a little bit of multiplication by running this multiple times, and that's it, and some memory. That's all you need to have a game system, or at least back then. Now game systems are a lot more complex. But yeah, PlayStation 1, this is the whole thing. And so as a computer engineer, not only do you have to design this whole layout, but you also have to say, okay, this ALU, this thing that does uh, arithmetic, so arithmetic logical unit, um, that does addition and subtraction, maybe multiplication, what component out of the you know, billions of components that we could choose from, what component is the appropriate component to stick right here and how, to con and how do we connect it to all of the other components? to this multiplexer, to this thing that allows us to select one input or another input. Um, you know, what kind of component would we use that's compatible with the L ALU that we chose? That's all up to the, the computer engineer to figure that all out. Um, and so again, just like the electrical engineer, uh, computer engineers are gonna have all kinds of really nifty equipment. And actually their equipment's even more expensive because they have uh, logic analyzers, um, which are quite pricey and very, very nifty creatures. Um, yeah, so electrical engineering requires you to know, know everything. Uh, it pays even better than being an electrical engineer, and that pays pretty good too. Okay, let's talk about cake. So I went to the cake store, and I went to get a cake, and they asked me, what do I want on my cake? And I, and I told them nothing. So I come back the next day to pick up my cake, and to my dismay, there's nothing on my cake. So I was like, okay, fine. I have a picture, it's on this flash drive, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just hand them the, they asked me what I want on the cake, and I hand them my flash drive, and I come back the next day to pick it up, and there it is, my flash drive on the cake. What am I getting at, you might ask. Well, for a human-to-human -human interaction, that might just be somebody being a smart ass. But for computers, we have to tell computers exactly what we want. Because the word literally, not like what a teenager says when they say literally, but like the actual definition of the word literally, means written exactly as it is meant to be interpreted. Something is either true or it is false. It is either one or it is a zero. Computers are really not good guessers. We have to tell them exactly what we expect from them, right? We had a really bad day. We come home, we slouch under the, under the, the couch, and we tell our robot, our, our robot friend, oh, kill me, right? We don't want that robot to kill us, right? We're just trying to express that we had a really bad day but the robot has no way of knowing that that's what we mean unless we program that specifically. Like, hey, if you hear the keywords, kill me, that means I had a bad day. Um, the thing though is that then what happens if somebody actually has the intention of saying, kill me, now it, now it thinks that the person's being sarcastic and is just trying to express that they had a bad day. Um, and so that's the, that's the issue that we run into is that computers are really not good guessers. We have to tell them exactly what we want from them. And that, and that may entail us programming in um, specific behaviors based on specific phrases that we might say that mean the opposite thing. Um, so just like the word literally, we would literally have to program that in to mean the opposite of literally, which might just cause the robot to catch fire. Um, or I mean that in the metaphorical and physical sense uh, of literally. So just like our vocabulary, how we use words uh, isn't consistent with our meanings. And so that's something that we need to be mindful about whenever we're interacting with computers or robots. 
So somebody asked me to build a gingerbread house and I was being a smart ass. So here's my gingerbread house. Yeah. I'm assuming all of you are rolling on the floor laughing because you're all, you're all muted. Okay, let's talk about algorithms. An algorithm is a series of step-by-step -step procedures uh, for learning calculation. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Okay. An algorithm is a series of step-by-step -step procedures for performing calculations, performing data, or, or sorry, processing data or performing actions. So I'm sure that in the morning, uh, you go through this, this cycle that's on the right side. You go from a sleeping state to a wake up state, you check the alarm clock. If it's too early, you go right back to sleep. There's this very clear process that you follow. And once it's eventually not too early uh, and you have to wake up, you instead stand up for your rights. It is unethical to wake up a human being at this time in the morning. You should all be allowed to sleep in. The things along those lines. But essentially, it's just like making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's all it is. We're just making peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We're, you know, taking taking uh, one slice of bread, throwing peanut butter on it, another slice of bread, throw, throwing jelly on it, slamming them together, shoving it into our face hole, and we got we got got ourselves a delicious delicious sandwich. But really, uh, we can think of it like a flow chart. So we have, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to start off with these, these four basic things. We got our Terminator. We've got our, um, let me move this. Can I move this other way? Excellent. Um, we've got our Terminator, which is used for starting and, and ending things. Um, we've got our process box. That's for doing stuff. We've got our decision diamond. Sometimes this is a triangle and this is for branching out and doing various things. And then we've got our input and output. So here's an example. We have our Terminator. We start it up. Say, do we have homework? If we don't have homework, then let's do some engineering stuff. And we continue this cycle until finally we have homework. And then can we procrastinate? Can we do it later? And now you do engineering stuff and now you're in this bigger loop. And you're always in this bigger loop until you've procrastinated way too much. You finally got to do your homework. That's a process. You do the homework and then you turn it in so that you have output. Your output is you turning in the homework and then you go right back to the beginning. Notice that there is no escape from this loop. There's no ending terminator. Uh, and that's just life. There's no escape. Um, but flowcharts are really important methods of communication or just documentation in general, which uh, no matter where you go, if you are going to be an engineer, you've got you've to nail these things down. You've got uh, Because a flowchart can help you break down uh, a task that might be massive that you might have no idea uh, it just you might look at it and go like there's no possible way that a human being could do this and if you're able to sort of break up that task into individual things of okay well we're going to start here we're going to do this thing or based on this decision based on this input of like okay is the soil sandy versus is it is it rocky um or we're going to do this thing instead of this thing and that allows you to, to make this clear flow chart of exactly the process that, that you're going to go through. Um, and the, the nifty thing is that you can, I mean, you can use it just for yourself to help break down a problem, to be able to solve it and to sort of pick at it, uh, pick at it one, one piece at a time. But it also allows you to communicate with other people, to be able to share with other people. Um, for example, one of the companies that I worked for, we were, um, we were building something that d did, um, uh, did, held private keys. It was essentially like a vault for um, for credit card number generators and, and national ID number generators. Um, something that had to be relatively secure. And um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the new credit cards that they have the little chip on them. Um, we were using those uh, for the DOD, uh, for the Department of Defense. Um, and that is how we authenticated with this device that would allow us to essentially generate more keys and uh, that would allow us to generate these, these, these numbers that were used in, in ID systems. Um, and so one of my jobs was to essentially um, get the company at a state where we were building these devices that would work properly and would make sense in the way that you would plug in 
authenticate to them and allow somebody to uh, plug in their cards and type in their pin in a certain order um, and then would eventually grant access to the to the device um, and so I made oh, zoom did the thing again can everyone still hear me yes yes, yes. okay yeah. fantastic yeah okay cool I, um, I, all right okay um, so I was able to essentially spend about 30 minutes made a flowchart of the procedure of, okay, you plug in the card, you type in the pin, then you hand the device over to this other person, they plug in their card, they type in their pin, and then after this happens, you know, three of the five people that are required for quorum, the device unlocks and allows them to generate that key. Um, that, I was, that I essentially made that flowchart, it took me like 30 minutes to, to write up, and then I was able to hand that flowchart to an engineer they were then able to build the device and, and, and program the device to do that. That took them about a month. And then after they came back to me and they said, okay, here's the device it should do what the flowchart said, I was able then to hand the flowchart to a, an intern, to a quality assurance engineer um, and the flowchart and the device to them and say, make sure that this device works to what this flowchart says. And so I was able to pawn off you know, in 30 minutes of labor on my side, I was able to pawn off months of work. Um, I was able to delegate it off to other people because I was able to communicate effectively uh, what the behavior is that I wanted this device to be. So it's really, really important to, to be able to do this. Um, initially, the first few years of college, I hated flowcharts. Just the idea, because I had always assumed that that had something to do with economics or business or whatever. But they are a very, very useful strategy for being able to break down problems and to be able to communicate to other people. Um, so yeah, get, get good at flowcharts because uh, they're going to help you in life. Um, and people are going to, people are going to like revere you. If, if you could be able to like, you know, take a group project, uh, whether it's at work or in school and be able to break break down the problem into all these individual chunks and then be able to hand out those chunks to individual people, you're going to be able to, to accomplish a lot very quickly. Um, yeah, so flowcharts, useful things. Um, and sometimes, a lot of times when I'm talking to computer science students and we're trying to just break down a problem, sometimes we don't even bother to like make, make the different shapes. We just uh, boxes and arrows is good enough for what we're doing to be able to explain a process of okay here we're going to ask the user for input then we're going to then we're going to uh, actually consume that input then we're going to do something with that input and then we're going to print something out to the screen but even though those are all just you know processes decisions and that input and output um, maybe just us being able to break it all up into individual pieces uh, is good enough for for, for our uses um, but if you want to use, if you want to be as professional as possible, you use the fancy different shapes, um, and that makes it a little bit easier to read as well. Any questions about flowcharts or, or algorithms in general? Okie dokie. Moving on. Right, so peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Put put jelly, put peanut butter, slam them together, shove them in your face. Delicious. All right, so this is normally you know, sort of a mini activity that I do in the class, um, but just to give you an idea, um, we'll still sort of mentally do it. Um, so there are these things called conditionals, and they allow us to run certain code on, or just run certain things under certain conditions. Um, and so like if I needed to filter out the class pretty quickly, I could have a condition that is if your shirt is black or white, and then I want them to say hi. That's how I would do it. And then maybe I want to know everybody who ha didn't say hi, which means that they didn't, ha they don't have a black or a white shirt. I want them to stand up. And so that's how I would write that code is right here. I would say, if your shirt is black or white, say hi. So everyone would say hi. And then anybody who didn't say hi, um, they're going to stand up. And so now suddenly I have a classroom with, you know, half of the class uh, standing up. And so then I now need to get them to sit down. 
And so I might have another condition that says, if you like pizza, sit down. And there's of course, always you know, some you know, smart aleck somewhere that's like, oh, well, I don't like pizza. So I say, if there's a whiteboard in the room, sit down. Uh, and there tends to be always a whiteboard in the classroom. And just in case, I also always have a whiteboard, uh, at least one in my backpack. Um, so I can guarantee at the, at the end of all of this um, that everybody is in fact sitting down again. Which is an important thing to be mindful about conditionals is that you can, you can construct them in a way that always guarantees you a, a particular outcome, um, irregardless, or sorry, just regardless of the, um, of the input. If you want a particular output, you can structure the conditions to, to, to work a certain way. And we'll see that in, in one of the activities that we will be able to do. So then we have these things called loops. And a loop is exactly what it sounds like. It's the action of doing something over and over again. Um, so I'm sure that you, um, I don't know, fairly recently, but maybe when you were younger, you asked your parent or guardian if you could have ice cream. And that you immediately, you initially assumed that the answer was no. And only if the response is yes, are you done and you've successfully gotten your ice cream. So what happens is that if the response is no, you ask them, can I have ice cream? And you continue this infinite loop until they tell you, yes, you can have ice cream, right? Can I have ice cream? No. Can I have ice cream? No. Can I have ice cream? No. Can I have ice cream? Yes. And success, you've gotten your ice cream. And so this could be an indefinite loop. This loop could run forever until the heat death of the universe, um, where you didn't get your ice cream, but the universe ended because you, know, you ran out of time. Um, and so this loop up here, you don't know how many times it's gonna run because they might say yes the first time. But another kind of loop that you might have is what we would call for loop that has a, a set number of time based on an input. So uh, I'm sure that on a road trip, based on your age, is the number of times that you, um, okay, um, the uh, based on your age is the number of times that you ask, are we there yet? And so we've just got more clever at asking it the older we get. Have we arrived at our destination or, or whatnot? Um, and so there's your know, age of six, then we run this loop, we run this same block of code six times to ask, are we there yet? And so this loop here, the number of times that it runs is determined by this input. Versus here, the input, the um, you don't know how many times it's gonna run because each time you take input, it's gonna, it may extend it or it may delay it. So here we take input once, here we could take input once, but we might take input an infinite amount of times. So those are loops, just the action of doing something over and over again. And it could be a very complicated operation. So now let's I, combine I those two one. things. There's, I got one. Oh, what, what's up? I got one. I got one. You got what? Uh, a loop I could use. Uh, a loop I could use. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it's, can, I, uh, can I use the restroom? Can I, can I use the restroom? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> and I know how to escape that, uh, or I don't know. Can you? Um, that's the, that's the appropriate response. Here. All right, um, right. Yeah, I I know the I'm, I know the trap there. Right? Okay, okay. But yeah, it's that same kind of concept of that of that loop of of uh, always you know, continue the loop until you escape. Um, I, I'm I'm no fun if if you haven't figured that out yet. Okay, so let's combine those two concepts. Let's combine our conditionals with our loops. And so let's have this, this awesome sandwich making robot for us. Um, and it has a condition of while I don't have five sandwiches, make a sandwich. So how many sandwiches is it going to make if it starts with no sandwiches? Five. 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 Yeah, and what happens if I come by and I swoop and I eat maybe the, 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 the first sandwich that it makes. How many sandwiches is it gonna make? 
total or like after? total or like after? total six six yeah six um and then what happens if i come by and this is a tricky one what happens if it made five sandwiches and i come by and i eat that fifth sandwich how many sandwiches is it going to make six six no so the way that the while loop works is that the moment the while loop is false it's done it, it stops the loop and so if I come, if it's completed the loop, if it's completed running, running all of that, um, then it's going to stop. But if, if it never resolves to false, um, so for example, every time it makes a sandwich, I eat another sandwich, um, then it would make, you know, an infinite amount of sandwiches. If I wanted it to always maintain five sandwiches in the stack, I could surround this whole thing with an infinite loop that could be while true, you know, while something is true. And then if I don't have five sandwiches, make a sandwich, then that would essentially maintain it having five sandwiches. Uh, but they, yeah, it's a little bit tricky. Is that a, no, a normal just while a loop, it runs and then the moment it's false, it's done. The moment this, this condition, is, is true, we're done. Cool. Okay, let's do vocab check. All right, what is a series of instructions on how to complete a task? An algorithm. An algorithm. All right, and then what is uh, what are statements that only run under, under certain circumstances? An if statement. An if statement. Yeah, or or, or conditionals. And then what are what are the what is the action of doing something over and over again? A loop. A loop. Indeed, a loop. All right. Okay, your brains are still squishy. Let's let's stick some more information in those. So, um, we've got some more vocab for you. So, coding is transforming actions into symbolic language, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be just whenever we're coding that we're we're taking our the actions or or information and translating into symbolic language that a computer understands, it might be uh, coding that's transforming that, that information or action into something that another human being understands. Uh, we see this with uh, people who do construction. We see this uh, with people who are maintaining some kind of standards. Um, we see this with, uh, with medical, uh, in the medical world, that nurses have to memorize tons and tons of these symbols and do this coding, and they actually call it coding. That they're that they're translating this information or this procedure into some kind of a symbolic language that can be understood by another person, um, and so they don't have to say you know that whole procedure name, but they're able just to give a code to another person, and that's enough to be able to communicate with the other person. So that's coding, being able to transfer, uh, transform actions or information into a symbolic language that something else is able to understand whether it's another person or a computer or whatnot. Um, debugging is the process of finding and fixing issues in your code. Um, and so this could also be something physical. Maybe you built a bridge, uh, you know, a test bridge, and for some reason it failed and going and figuring out how it failed and why it failed and then fixing, fixing it so it doesn't fail again, that would be the process of debugging. And then a function is a piece of code that can be called over and over again. So uh, we can imagine our microwave at home uh, has a while loop that's just always a while true. The microwave always will always hopefully run that you know it doesn't it doesn't just stop working after five times that it's a it's a it's a loop that runs on forever. Um, but that internally it has this function that essentially is when you hit that start button that it will then cook your food. Um, the thing though is that you need to be able to change its behavior. Well, and you need to be able to call, you need to be able to call cook multiple times. Um, and so the way that we change the behavior of the function cook on the microwave is with these parameters or arguments where we give this extra bits of information to the function that customize it. So like your microwave, uh, your microwave, you're able to put in, you know, the, 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 the temperature setting and how long it is. You might even be able to specify if it's popcorn or not. And that extra information changes the behavior of how it works. Um, 
yeah, so, so that, there's a little bit of extra vocab. Okay, let's do some conditionals. Let's see if I can find a deck of cards somewhere. All right. Okay. All right. So um, this first part right here, we have this if red plus one, else plus two. What is this else card covering? Anybody who has knowledge of, of a deck of cards? What, 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 what colors do we have in a deck of cards? Red and black. Red and black. Yeah, okay. So if we have red covered, what does this else cover? Black. Black. Yeah, exactly. So essentially, if the card is black, it's plus two points. And so one of the nifty things about this is that if we have some knowledge about the data that we're or the, the data or whatever we're working with, um, that we're able to write this else and we're able to know exactly what it covers. And so we don't have to say if it's black, we can just say if red else, which means that it wasn't red, which must mean that it's black. Um, what about the second, what about the, the, the second example? So we have if it's red plus one point and then else if it's clubs minus Minus one point. What does this else cover? Spades. Spades. Yeah, exactly. Spades. And so we don't have to write it explicitly, um, but with some knowledge of, of a deck of cards, we're we're able to, to write code uh, that's that's relatively simplistic in, in that way. Um, and this only works with a traditional deck. Uh, if you go to France and try to use one of their deck of cards, uh, that's going to mess you up because they they have different colors. Um, but like, if you go to any civilized country, uh, you're going to be, you're going to be okay. Safe All right. Huh? Never mind. Never mind. Okay. So let's do this, this guy. Uh, let me power up my webcam. Uh, where is it? Um, here we go. I think. Actually, I don't know if I can flip it. Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, okay. Is that backwards for everyone? Or is it just me? Uh, it seems uh, right. It seems right. Okay. So you can you can see that number. Okay. Yeah. I might just be dyslexic here. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So let me read through the rules. Uh, so all of you are on a team, and you're all against me. Um. I start at 10 points. All of you start at 10 points. We're, just, we're not going to use a full deck of cards. We're just going to use, I just grabbed, just grabbed some cards out of a pile. I shuffled it a little bit. Um, the team with the most points is going to win. So where this says other team, that's me. And then where it says your team, that's all of you together. Um, and then you are all responsible for keeping track of your score and my score. So frequently, I'm going to ask you uh, what what my score is and what your score is, because uh, I have terrible memory. So uh, let's get this party started. So what is this? Is this lower than nine? No. No. Okay. So what happens? You award your team your points, points on the card. On the card. Not quite. So this if here, this block, this purple oh, block, this oh, inner, oh. yeah. So it's not lower than nine. So this else happens. So what happens? The other team loses, the other team loses points. points. Okay. So what am I at? Uh, uh, not nine. So what, what am I one. at? Negative one. No. What do we all start out with? Ten. 10. So you're at 10. Yeah. So you're at 10. Are you sure? Yes. When it says other team, when, when it says other team, what does that mean? You. You. Us. Yeah. Us. You have nine points. You have nine points now. Yes. And what are you at? N. N. Okay. What about here? What, what happens here? Is, is it lower than nine? No. 
Lose a point. Guess what happens? You lose another point. Okay, and then what happens here? Is this lower than nine? Yes. Yes. Okay, so what happens? What happens? I gain a point. What am I at now? Ten. Nine. What am I at? Nine. What are you at? Nine. What are you at? Ten. 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 Okay, you're still at ten. Okay, there we go. Okay, now what happens? Is this lower than nine? Yes. Yes. Okay. Is it black? Yes. Yes. So what happens? We add seven. We add seven. Yep. So what are you at now? Seventeen. Seventeen. Okay. Now what happens? Is this, is this lower than, than nine? Yes. 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 And so what happens? You get a point. You get a point. Okay. So what am I at? Ten. Ten. Oh, wait. All right. I can't math, so. What, I can't math, so. What happens here? You get a point. You get a point. Okay. Wait. Wait. So what am I at? Now ten. Now ten. Okay. So is, is this is this lower than nine? No. No. Okay, so what happens? Okay, so what am I at now? Nine. Nine. Okay. Last card. Is this lower than nine? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Is it black? Yes. yes. What happens? Mm -hmm. We gain three. We gain three. Okay, so what are you at? Twenty. Twenty. Okay, and what am I at? Nine. Nine. Right. Okay. So I think that I think I think that illustrates the point. Um, was there any way with a standard deck of cards that I could win? No. 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 Right. I I essentially was losing it and gaining points. I was actually losing points faster than I could gain them. Uh, versus you guys, you were gaining points at, at a very quick rate. Um, and so this was us using credentials to, to have a particular outcome occur. Right? The deck was literally stacked against me. The rules were stacked against me. Now, do you think that maybe a casino does something like this, but in the reverse way. They're able to make rules that seem relatively fair, um, but, in, in, um, but in their way, they're able to make the rules so that in most cases, in 99% of the cases, that they win. But you look at the rules of the game and you say, oh, that looks pretty reasonable. Um, so conditionals can be used to, to, to essentially cause a particular outcome um, to occur that you want to have happen or to be able to handle those circumstances. While still going to casinos or playing these games where you know the, the, it's, the, the odds are stacked against you um, can still be quite fun. Um, I just want to you know, illustrate the importance of, um, of how these games are created. And yeah, just be mindful about such things. Okay, all right. This class what ends ends at uh, nine or ten? Nine oh five. Nine oh five. Okay, nine oh five. Nine oh five. Nine oh five. Oh, that was nine oh five. Oh, that was nine oh five. Yeah, so something something around that that time. Okay, cool. Let's move on to robates. Do any of you know who either of these individuals are? That's Daft Punk on the left. Daft Punk on the left. <laughs> not, not quite. 
<laughs> okay. So uh, on the right, this is George Takei. This is from Star Trek, the original series. And this here is R2. This is a robot that's up at the International Space Station. Uh, you can tell by his sleek uh, uh, torso, you know, lower torso. That hopefully that's not a human being. Um, I would be very concerned if he was. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so he's, he's a robot that's up at the International Space Station, and he's running actually the same code as uh, the robots that I had, that, that I was showing you earlier, um, both Kiri and uh, Hopper, the robot. Um, they're running the same base operating system, robot operating system. Um, and R2 was sent up to the International Space Station uh, to be able to perform things like spacewalks, things that might be uh, very dangerous for uh, humans to do. I don't think R2 has done a spacewalk yet, but R2 has been up at the International Space Station uh, being tested with in zero G environments for, for quite a while. Um, and originally they built just the sort of this upper body part and sent, and sent R2 up to the space station. Um, and later they were they would, had the intention of designing and sending up legs. And one of the things that they realized was that you know, standard human legs are fairly useless in space. Um, and that the astronauts, when they were doing spacewalks, uh, that spacewalks would take you know, hours, like five to eight hours to do a very simple operation of you know, moving something, one thing to another thing and unscrewing a few bolts and then, you know, and then bolting a back, bolt, bolting a module back in. Um, I mean, I watched a spacewalk where it was it was about eight hours, and all they were doing was was taking, uh, unplugging some batteries and plugging in some new batteries, because you practically in space, um, your feet are pretty much useless, and you have to essentially hold on to the space station with one hand at all times, um, and so you know, lining up a bolt. And, uh, and, and, and a screw gun and, and then trying to screw on the, you know, screw onto a nut that's also floating around is a very difficult thing in zero G because the moment you poke anything, it just flies away. Um, and so when they were designing uh, R2's legs, they were able to have that in mind that the International Space Station has this railing that goes all around the space station um, as a uniform size that the legs could essentially you know, manipulate in any direction and uh, are specially designed to be able to grab onto the railing of the space station. So suddenly we have this robot, you know, this robot that looks sort of like a human, like its upper half, and it's able to actually use both of its hands, um, which means that spacewalks could be performed much quicker um, and that the robot itself could, could autonomously do it. It could do it by itself. Um, but also that uh, somebody on the ground or uh, in the space station could manually control it as well. They could maybe have a set of gloves that they put on um, and they could then manually interact with, with whatever it is. So maybe during uh, a case where there's meteor showers or, or I don't know if it's asteroids at that point, um, um, uh, happening where sending out a, an astronaut to go and fix something um, might be very, very dangerous. Uh, and a robot is going to be a lot more robust to being hit by, uh, by uh, a piece of uh, sand or, or a rock going hundreds or if not thousands of miles an hour um, versus a human that would kill them pretty much instantly. Um, so you could make um, the, the situation of doing the spacewalks much safer for human beings by sending these robots out to do it for us. And hopefully they don't resent us for, for us doing that to them. Um, it's easier to fix them than it is us. You know, a little bit of duct tape and, and they're off to the races. Uh, uh, humans tend to not appreciate them when you put duct tape on them to fix a wound. Okay, yeah, so these were the two robots that are running exactly the same software base as, as R2 over there. R2 is up at the International Space Station versus Hopper is literally on my shoulder right now. Um, and Kiri is um, up in the 100 building right next to the STEM Center um, once the, the once the plague has been resolved, uh, Kiri will be released back into the STEM Center. But right now she's a she's a plague she's a plague vector, so I, I took her out of out of the out of the area to reduce that. But yeah, um, Hopper here is is uh, tasked with collecting 
these these resources, these little cubes. That's what that that the diagram was in the beginning that I was showing you was it was everything to do with this particular robot, um, or this classification of robot, which is a swarmy. And there are, are a few hundred of these robots wandering around uh, all over uh, the U.S. and the U.S. territories. Um, so, like in Puerto Rico, I think we've got like six or nine of them uh, wandering around. And they collect these cubes and they deliver them home. Where's Kiri over here? Kiri just looks cute. Um, you can pet her and she purrs and, and all of that. And so it's all hunky dory. Okay, let's talk about types of robots. So I, um, I like to do a lot of generalizing and sort of breaking down robots into two distinct categories. One is a remote control or telerobot. This is where all of the decision making is on the human. The human is the one that's ultimately decided what's happening. We can also call this semi-autonomous. Maybe you have a quadcopter that's floating in the air and you hit a button, the human hits a button that says stay put. That drone has to, or that quadcopter has to make has to be making tons of lots of little decisions of I need to apply a little bit more power here and a little bit of power here and I need to you know move back to my original position because maybe a gust of wind blew it blew it out of the way but ultimately the human was the one that made the decision of it to stay there it just has to have, make all these little micro decisions um, on how it's going to then achieve that task and so that's considered semi-autonomous but in the, in the case of a bomb squad robot you don't want any of that. You want it to be immediately remote control. You want that you press a button, it does a very particular thing. Um, and so that is a strictly remote control robot. Um, Verse, the other type of robot that we have, which are autonomous robots, um, where all the decision making is based on the environment and data input, that there's not any kind of like human at the controls physically moving a joystick back and forth, but the robot itself is, is doing all, all the driving itself. Um, and we can watch a video, but essentially what happens is that these have these giant platforms that are like screws that they screw up and then they pick up this shelf and then they drive around and deliver that shelf. And so uh, here's, here's a video, um, I'm just gonna mute that. Um, but essentially you get the idea that these robots are essentially able to drive around and they're able to pick up these shelves and deliver them to, to locations. And so there's a human called a picker that these robots bring to. And so here's a picker right here. And that was it. Um, and so what the picker does is that they essentially stand, uh, stand put and the shelves are brought, um, the shelves are brought to the picker and there's a little laser that then shines on the spot where the picker needs to grab the thing out of the, out of the spot and they throw it in the box and they hit a giant button and that tells the robot, hey, I got the item out of the, out of, out of the shelf and I put it in the box. And that tells the robot that, hey, you're done with that shelf and the robot can then come and pick up that shelf and go deliver it where it needs to be. Um, and that also tells the other robot that's holding the box um, that, hey, you've put that item in the box and if that's the last item, it's then gonna you know, take that box off somewhere else. Um, not all the fulfillment Amazon centers use these. Only a few of them do. Um, there's still a lot of them that require people to physically walk you know, tens of miles uh, on a daily basis to go to the shelves and pull things out. Um, but the idea being is that the, right now, the, really, the, the only, human or, uh, only humans that are required um, ultimately would be somebody to pick, you know, pull things out of a shelf um, that the shelf is coming to you. Um, and that the area that these robots are operating uh, is very confined to just robots and that the robots are able to scan these tags that are on the ground uh, to be able to communicate with each other um, where they are. And when they see this tag, they also know where they are, um, which is useful. And this tag is an April tag. It's exactly the same cube uh, that we see on the, the resources that, that Hopper here has in our gripper. Um, yeah, and so they're able to localize themselves by these little stickers on the ground. Um, and they go quite fast and are very heavy uh, and do not want to be run over by them. And so humans are not allowed in the area that these robots are performing. And 
Um, and MIT is working on grippers to be able to grab things out of these out of these uh, out of these shelved spots, um, and then that will eliminate the need for humans entirely. Uh, but right now, uh, we need humans because we're able to feel pressure on our fingers, uh, and we're able to pull things out of shelves fairly effectively. All right. Uh, another field of, of robotics that doesn't quite fit in types of robotics is bionics. And bionics is essentially the application of biological methods and systems found in nature to the study and design of engineering systems and modern systems and vice versa. So the idea of us being able to, to, to see things in, in nature and then apply those concepts to engineering and the other way around, be able to take things from engineering and apply them to nature. Um, and so we have some you know, beautiful things that we might see. We might see uh, taking the wheel, a concept that's an engineering concept, and apply it to a biological being like a pig. I'm sure that in nature, you've never seen a pig with wheels. But once you pair the two, uh, it's a, actually a quite effective thing uh, to do for a pig that otherwise couldn't um, mosey around on its own because maybe has a defect in its legs. Or that we see bugs in nature and that we're able to essentially reproduce them with circuitry. Or that we're able to replace uh, our various limbs um, with, with robotic limbs. I've actually seen, I've actually seen one where they, they, they didn't even bother to make it look anything like a human limb and they, they instead made it a tentacle that could, that could articulate in both, you know, in both directions. Um, because suddenly you don't have to deal with joints anymore. You could design any kind of arm that would work in any fashion. Um, or uh, I'm sure that, that some of you have seen an exosuit. Um, uh, the, there's this one here. Uh, it's out of a graphic novel uh, thing. I, I think it's called an Iron Man. Um, and there are military grade exosuits that I cannot show you pictures of. Um, but there are these consumer grade exosuits like this one that otherwise somebody who would be wheelchair bound, um, they're essentially able to strap themselves into this and they're able to uh, control it around. And it's essentially these platforms that just, you know, are, are able to walk by themselves and you stick a human being in it and voila, you're, you're off to the races. Um, but also we have ways of augmenting um, humans, uh, with things like this is a cochlear implant that we were talking about earlier. Um, this is essentially able to communicate with a chip that is uh, inside the skull uh, that has uh, lots of little electrodes that are uh, tied into little incisions on the cochlear nerve. And this is able to essentially have a microphone that receives sound, interprets it to uh, you know, something into, into electrical signals, sends those electrical signals through, through a, a little antenna that's then received on the part that's inside the brain or inside the skull. Uh, and then that converts it into electrical impulses again uh, and delivers that to the nerve. And suddenly you are able now to have somebody have some semblance of a sensation of sound. Um, and for some reason, for some people, this is, this is quite effective and other people uh, not so much. Uh, so where do we see robots? Well, we, we see them pretty much everywhere in pretty much every industry. Right, we see them in space. Uh, robots have pretty much beat us to, to every planetary body that we're going to be going to, and they'll probably continue to beat us uh, for, for a long time because it's, it's very feasible to send them there first to judge the environment for us. Um, and this robot, to give us a perspective of how big this is, this is about the size of a suburban. That's a giant, that's a giant vehicle. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty big ro rover, and we think about rovers as these cute little tiny things that like, like the thing that I have sitting on my shoulder, um, that's, you know, a little, a little smaller than my torso. Um, but this robot here, uh, is, is as big as a very big, very large car. But we also see it in manufacturing. One of the nifty things is that you don't have to pay them. You don't have to feed them. Um, and they can run fairly continuously, um, with very limited brakes. Uh, typically, uh, Automotive factories, we power them down for about four hours per a week, and that's just to reduce the um, electromagnetic field. Um, yeah, and, and robots don't tend to get bored doing the same thing over and over again. They're actually very, very good at that, as opposed to humans, where you tell a human to drill 
a, a hole in a particular spot over and over again, um, they're start, gonna get, start to get bored and they're just gonna start you know, adding in some inaccuracies. They're gonna be you know, drilling the hole in crooked and doing all kinds of things. So uh, having, having robots take over those roles makes a lot of sense to do that tedious work. And then you can take the people that were previously working on you know, the, you know, drilling those holes and they can now supervise the robots that are drilling the holes or help develop the code that would uh, have the robots uh, do that. And suddenly now those people are able to affect on a much larger scale, a lot more manufacturing. Um, then cars, I, I promised you I would talk about cars. So there, there's the cars. So this is a little Google car. Um, we see self-driving cars popping up all over the place. Uh, Ford has, a, has applied in California for a driver's license for their car. So you could literally buy a car that has a driver's license itself, which means that you don't even have to have a driver's license and the car could then drive you around and it could also drive itself around without anybody in it. Um, well, that may be initially a very scary thought. If we think about it, if a car makes mis a mistake and there's thousands of this particular car out on the road, you can correct that mistake in code and deploy it to all those cars simultaneously. So imagine the car doesn't see the ledge of the road and it drives and it drives off um, and hopefully it doesn't hurt anybody. Um, that the car has a lot of extra sensors and we can analyze those sensors. Sorry. Um, we can analyze the sensors to then prevent that from happening again. And then we can deploy that fix to lots and lots of cars all simultaneously. Versus say we have a teenager who's just now learning how to drive and they drive off the road because uh, they didn't see the line. Um, hopefully they survive and hopefully they learn from the incident that hey, even though there's no line there, the end of the road is right there and that they don't make that mistake again. But that's only affecting one person. So they had to make that mistake so each of those teenagers that you know, drive by that spot, they all each individually have to make that mistake. And that may in, introduce uh, enormous amounts of risk to their health and their safety versus a self-driving car. Um, if it ever does make a mistake, the hope is if it's done and handled properly, then all of those cars only would make that mistake once in the sense that it, only one of them would have to make that mistake and all of them could benefit and learn from that mistake. So I'm a lot more willing to self to trust a self-driving car um, based on just that very concept. Um, I agree that them being able to have the distributed knowledge and be able to share information like that uh, can be very detrimental. Somebody could definitely abuse that and that's something that we should be mindful of. But that overall, I think the concept uh, is very important. We've already seen here in Mountain View um, that just these Google cars, were, they, they actually communicate with each other real time um, on predictions of things that they see. And one of them had actually seen a bicycle that was doing some very erratic things. And it was able to tell another, uh, another one of the same car, hey, there's a bicycle, it's heading towards your intersection uh, and it is in one of your blind spots. Um, because the lasers have blind spots because there, maybe there's another car or there's a pole in the way. Um, and that literally the, the driver behind the wheel, uh, or I mean the person behind, behind the wheel um, of the Google vehicle, the, it literally just stopped in the middle of the intersection and the guy was freaking out. He's like, what's going on? And then you know, the, a bicycle zooms right by um, because the other Google car was able to communicate to that car that something dangerous was going to happen. Um, and we also see it in the medical industry. We see the, the ability that a surgeon can move their, their arms a great deal and that it just moves the robot in a very small fashion. And this also allows us to replay and record um, uh, uh, surgeries and that eventually after enough machine learning uh, happens that the robot itself could perform the surgeries. So in this case right here, this is essentially the robot is assisting the surgeon, that the surgeon is able to make very large movements um, and that the robot will convert them into very tiny mo movements. Okay, um, we are skipping that. Uh, 
Okay. We already did flowcharts. A few minutes. We're not doing my robotic friends. Uh, so yeah, robots can be you know done for funsies, right? They can they can solve Rubik's cubes in uh, 0.8 seconds. Um, they can play soccer relatively. Yeah, there we go. Done there. Can play soccer uh, relatively well if the goalie is absolute garbage. Um, yeah. So robots can be be used for fun as well. Um, and that we have multiple ways of talking to robots. That we have you know we have these game controllers. Um, to this robot that's right next to me, uh, if I need to test the motors or the gripper, I plug in an Xbox 360 controller into the robot um, and then manually uh, cause the different uh, the different components to move around. Um, but also, you know, Bomb Squad, there's, there's this the remote control thing um, for it, but that maybe there's people standing behind them that are giving them commands, telling them what wire to cut or, or, or whatnot, um, or just a normal RC car or maybe mission control, that you have these teams of people all lined up and that individually they all work together. Maybe this team here is responsible for moving the arm. They're responsible for moving the gripper. These people are responsible for shooting the laser to vaporize the material. And this team all the way up in the front is the science team that says, hey, go pick up that rock and vaporize it and tell us which, what kind of mineral that you, you, you see. And so they have to coordinate with all of these people um, to make sure that their calculations are correct and to perform those actions, um, which is really important because maybe you have a robot and um, you might accidentally run into the robot with your own arm as they're moving it around. And that can cause you to physically dam damage the robot or damage the sensor. Uh, and now that robot no longer is able to provide you the scientific data that, that it used to. So having all of these people to be able to divvy up all of the work, but also to check each other's work is really important. Um, and we have lots of different kinds of sensors. Robots have tons of different sensors. We have particle sensors like Geiger counters and smoke detectors. We can detect weather stuff like pressure, water, heat, solar radiation. Um, uh, they, they have visual sensors like uh, X-ray, ultraviolet, and normal and infrared. Um, if you ever notice like your, uh, if, if you're trying to figure out why your, why your TV remote doesn't work, you could actually take your um, your your phone, point your TV remote at the camera on your your phone, press some buttons, and what happens is that the screen on your phone uh, only displays things uh, um, in, in the normal spectrum, the visible spectrum for us, uh, versus the camera that's on your phone has a much wider spectrum. It can see ultraviolet and infrared light. And so what happens is that it converts that light that it sees out of the TV remote into something that you can see. So if you're ever checking if, if you have a dead battery in your TV remote or if something's just blocking your TV, um, that's a pretty easy test to do. And so these robots are able to make much better decisions um, based on what they, what they see um, because they see more than we do. And you can stick as many cameras all around the vehicle um, as you want, versus us humans are pretty much limited to these two eyeballs that we got on us. Um, and then bumper, bumper switches, uh, feedback like light encoders. So like when a motor, when, when a wheel turns, uh, there's encoders that essentially send pulses that tell us how much they've turned or, uh, or feedback from a human or other. So a human feedback might be good robot or a bad robot, that, that's feedback. Then we have the sonar, radar, and lasers. Essentially, we're sending out information, whether or not it's sound or light, and then we're trying to figure out, or radio waves, and we're trying to figure out what, you know, how far away we are from things. And so here, this little dome is a laser. It shoots laser off in every direction, and it looks for impacts, and that tells us, and that gives us an idea of, uh, of the environment that it's looking at. And then lots of other kinds of sensors. Uh, and robots have lots of ways of moving around their environment. We have these servos. Uh, and servos are really nifty because if you tell a servo to go into a particular spot, it does that. But they're not very strong. They're not very powerful. So we typically use, you know, bigger after your duty stuff. We use hydraulics, things that we see on tractors. We have giant motors, AC or DC motors. We have plasma propulsion like what we have on satellites. We have uh, electromagnetism. Um, and so one of the things about uh, electromagnets uh, or just robotics in general is this movement is not just restricted to the robot itself. It might be its environment. The robot itself might not need to, it doesn't need to move itself uh, to be considered a robot. It either needs to move itself or move its environment around it. 
Um, so in this case, we see an electromagnet on a train where the robot, the train, is moving itself. First here, we see this robot with this electromagnet where what it does is it picks up cars and giant metal things and moves them around. So this, this robot here is moving its environment around versus this robot here is moving itself. Uh, gears are cool. Uh, essentially, they allow us to change. That's what this, del this delta symbol means, change direction. So if you have two gears of the same size, one spins one way, the other one spins the other way. But if you change their sizes, they allow us to change the speed and the torque at which something spins. So you, you can see that in this diagram. Hopefully this is coming out okay. Um, but also, if you've ever climbed, if you, if you have a cruiser bike, if you've ever tried to like go up a hill on a cruiser bike, uh, you're going to be sweating a bit. It's pretty hard. But if you had a bicycle that had gears that you could switch gears um, to reduce your speed but increase your torque, um, then suddenly you're going to be um, having a much easier time uh, going up a hill. Uh, and then I like to talk about pulleys. Essentially, they allow us to, to move things. They allow us to change the direction of force. So essentially, we're able to pull down, and then instead that pulls this thing up. And one of the nifty things is that if you add more pulleys, you're able to reduce the amount of force but increase the distance that you travel. So say this is a 100-pound weight. I'm able to pull down with 25 pounds of force, but over four times the distance. I'm able to pull four times the distance, but less force, and I'm able to pick up this weight. So pulleys are really nifty things uh, to give you a mechanical advantage, just in general. Okay, and this would have been an activity that, that we would do but we're not going to. So that's robots, um, and that's everything. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for, for your time. Uh, let me know if you Thank have any you. questions. Thank you. Is that, is that it? Is that, is that it? That's, that's it. Thank you. Just power Thank through you. it. I kind of had a question for the rest of the class. I couldn't find I couldn't the quiz find for structural, structural engineering. Is that on there? I couldn't find it either. I'm going to email her. Okay. Yeah. okay. I think Roxanne's hiding. She might know that. Okay. If you email her, he'll fix it. Thank right. you, Carter. That was awesome. Thank you, Carter. That was awesome. Hey, you're welcome. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions about anything Cabrera related, um, or need support in any way, or, or yeah, yeah, have it, yeah, have any questions? Uh, feel free to email me. I have one right. question. Um, if we wanted to join the robotics club, the and we have, club. you know, we're yeah. freshmen and have no, freshmen and have no seeming skills. Skills. What do we? What do we what do, we do, in, the what do, we do in the robotics club? Uh, there's lots of roles. I mean, uh, so blast an email to Marine at, at this email address. Um, but yeah. It, really no skills or, or all of the skills, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, if you, if, if we, if we have like a situation of like, Hey, this is what the robot sees, what's the best thing that it could do. Um, that doesn't really require any, any experience with programming or anything like that, uh, to be able to sort of come to that decision. And that's one of the most difficult things about, ro about robotics is, uh, what do we do given the situation? Um, and a lot of cases, uh, the, the human experience is the best thing to do. Uh, so like an exercise that I do with some of the students is um, I like blindfold them where they can only see like two feet in front of them. And then I say like, okay, go find, go find some cubes. And I just watch how they do it. And then we will literally just write that on the whiteboard. And that tends to be like a really good exercise um, because the robot has to deal with that same kind of situation. Um, so having no experience uh, is, is actually a blessing um, and not just a curse because sort of ignorance is bliss that you, you're you not constrained to how we learned how to do things, uh, maybe in a computer science class or in a computer information class, um, that a fresh perspective is, is, is very valuable. So, so yeah, I, I encourage you to email Maureen and, and to join up. Cool, thanks. on the announcement that the quiz will follow at a later date. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Thanks, Carter. I got to head out. Carter, I got to head out. Okay, yep. See you.
All right. Okay.